What's happening? Welcome to the 28th episode of the Slap Stream with Jorge, live from Slapsville. And today I am not in California, I'm actually in Croatia. And I had a little issue here with the, the intro, and because we had, if, I'm not sure if you noticed, um, we have like a, like a pretty cool intro with the snowflakes and all of that coming up, since this is a Christmas special. So uh, I hope you like it. And the guy that is responsible for that is Nikki Lugoshi, who offered his uh, uh, designer services to Slapstream and Slapsville a couple episodes ago. Uh, pump up the volume. I'm not sure if I can pump up the volume. Um, let me see. Is it better like this maybe now? Hopefully it is because I don't see an option. I don't have all my Slapsville uh, gear here. Hopefully the volume is better now. Will someone tell me? I'm waiting for you guys. I depend on you guys. Do you hear me? Is it better than when I had? Oh, okay, awesome. So it's better than with uh, headphones. Oh, so I'm getting rid of these. Uh, as I said, welcome to the 28th episode of the Slap Stream uh, with Georgia live from Slapsville. And this is, I guess, a Christmas special episode. And we are all used to see Brian Setzer Orchestra for last, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so, or 20 years, I don't know, we'll ask our guest uh, doing his annual Christmas tour around this time. But as we all know, it's the end of the world, so we're not going to be able to see, uh, we're not going to be able to see Brian Setzer, but we're going to be able to see his bass player and we're going to be able to see his drummer here, as I see one of my favorite drummers, Bernie Dressel, just joined us. Um, so special shout out goes to Nikki Lugosi. Uh, thanks a lot. We did all this like very, 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 <laughs> very last minute. So, but I'm glad we did it. We got all the fancy intro. Uh, welcome to all of you. Um, there's like lots of people joining. I'm really glad that the Slapstream audience is growing and it's getting bigger and bigger every week. If you're not subscribed to my channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I really depend on that. And make sure to ring the bell. Uh, that means that you're going to actually receive the notification when I go live or when I upload a new video, which is what I really want you to yet so you don't miss it and so that i'm not doing all these videos for for no uh no audience youtube algorithm is weird these days so make sure to click that uh, subscribe button if you really would like to support the slap stream and um, stuff that i do make sure to check out venmo and paypal links under the this video in the description and patreon Patreon has been really excellent and uh, and and it's really helping me out like to do these shows. So check out the Patreon link uh, in the description of this video as well. And without further ado, I would like to introduce my today's guest, Johnny Spaz Hatton. Hello. Welcome. How are you doing, Georgie? I'm doing excellent. How are you? I'm swell. And uh, the weather is great. I'm outdoors with my girls, as you can see in the background. Well, let me do this so that everybody can see this. Here, let's do this. All right, now we got them all. And I got my... That's a great picture. This is a very special sweatshirt that my son got me. Birthday boy. All right. Everybody thinks it's my birthday, but no, look close at the, it's his birthday coming up. Yeah, see? I recognize yeah. that. <laughs> it's his birthday. His birthday is on 25th, right? Yes. Many okay. 
And you know, Lemmy's birthday uh, is on the 24th. I celebrate that one every every year. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we've got like a lots of people here joining us, and uh, Bernie Dressel is in the house. You know, I love him that we cannot hear him play, but you know, there's like some students of yours. Um, Swash Buckler Paul wrote, oh, Spaz, I got my first lesson from you 17 years ago. Holy cow. So how that Yeah, work? so we got our regulars and awesome. So we're all here and people from all over, like Tommy from Finland. Oh boy. Jack just wrote, Lemmy Nods. That's true. Lemmy. And Betty. Betty just said that you have a great outfit. Yes. So, yes. Betty. You know, and Bernie wrote Spazalicious. Oh, Bernie-licious. <laughs> yeah. I thought this would be Slapalicious, but, you know, for yeah. this episode, I'm, I'm cool with Spazalicious. Ber <laughs> Bernie is Bashalicious. Bashalicious. That's hard to say. Uh, so how are you? Let's let's start this thing. You know, I'm excited. Everybody is excited. I have lots of questions for you. I hope you have time. And um, uh, first, I would like to ask you, how are you holding up during this craziness, during the this pandemic and no music, no gigs, no uh, life that we're used to live be before yeah. March 2020? Well, I've been uh, lucky to have a, a, some skills in carpentry and home construction, only because being a poor musician all these years, you figure out how to do it yourself because you can't afford to hire a guy to come over and, you know, do do stuff. So I got a truckload of tools and I've been working nonstop at home renovation for friends, mostly musicians. Well, they are all musicians, actually. So I've been doing well. If you need anything, I'm glad to production work, folks. Just give me a call. I'll show up in my '62 GMC pickup. It's full of tools, got portable saws and all kinds of stuff, routers and hammers and nails. <laughs> Isn't that a car that it's on the cover of Gospel Bop CD? Uh, that that is not. In fact, I have one right here. That is a friend's car. That that belonged to uh, one of the guys in the Yakety X. Uh, that's a 40 Ford pickup. Mine's a 62 GMC. It's a little newer than that. But you can see my pickup in the movie Ford versus Ferrari. I, I get my, in fact, we just did a, we just finished a film uh, featuring Bradley Cooper with my truck. We did something like 25 days of shooting. Then it's good money. Actually, the truck makes more money than I do. It makes two fifty to for the day, and I, I get scale, which is about one seventy five SAG scale, and mainly just sit around and eat. Occasionally, you drive up and down a street. Oh, uh, we have a uh, Andrew from Russia joining us as well, and Johnny X wrote that. Gospel Bop is a great album. We still play it live all the time. Bless your heart, Johnny X. Thank you so much. By the way, the famous Bernie Dressel is on this album. I don't know. The credits are inside. But uh, we had so much fun doing that. <clears throat> uh, let us know right, right from the beginning, like where people can get and buy that album. Ah, johnnyhatton.com. Did I luck out or what getting that <laughs> that website, johnnyhatton.com? And you can also grab a hold of one of these. This was, okay, I, I stole this at, at NAMM show. It's, it's, it's the display issue when it first launched at Hal Leonard. So I, I, I nicked it. You can see it says for display purposes only. So this is a very rare copy of, of rockabilly wow. baby. <laughs> wow, okay. So, but whoever wants to buy it, buy it, they can go to johnnyhatton.com and yep. get the album and get the rockabilly bass book. Yep. And um, I, and then, 
I got some new product coming out. I've been making transcriptions of my bass lines on different recordings. So they'll be coming out pretty soon. So if you guys want to learn how to read a little bit, in case I fall into an orchestra pit to my doom, you need to read <laughs> to get the gig. It helps. All right. <laughs> I think it's, it will be better, like, you know, if people really learn how to read, you know, properly charts and notes and then uh, and slap, right? Yep, and slap. Yep. Uh, yeah, and, and let's start, we, like, when, when did you start playing music? What's that? Oh, me? I started on violin when I was about six years old. My dad brought one home from a violin shop in um, we lived in missouri but he would go he was a uh, on the on the music staff at, Clu at at missouri university in columbia and there was a violin maker there named jc ashlock <clears throat> and he he repaired all like, violins from all over the state and actually he's pretty famous um the setzer tour came through columbia missouri and our venue was right across the street from that old violin shop. And I, I crossed the street, went up the long flight of skinny stairs. And at the top of the stairs was a broadcasting studio for to, uh, rock and roll, top 40 and this and that kind of vintage music. And they said, can you do an interview? And I said, sure. So uh, the uh, other bass player who was on the, the Rockabilly Riot Tour, the two of us went up and did an interview and uh, uh and i saw jc ashlock's picture on the wall it was signed by a whole bunch of violin players that were cl clients of his he's long since passed but i do have a violin made by jc ashlock it's it's a really nice instrument too i still play it in the church band occasionally and uh that's so cool so but but uh, so violin was first. How old were you? I was six years old when I got my violin, and, and Dad started teaching me. And I, I would, would kind of learn by rote because I, I didn't catch on to the notes. I, I figured them out after, you know, three or four years. By the time I got into uh, uh, like grade school, I could read, but really slowly. And I'd, I'd have to have Dad. Dad, can you play this for me? And he would play the exercise, dobo dee ba dooby dooby, and I'd listen. And oh, okay, I had some, I guess, tonal memory helped out. And so I did all the all the Kreutzer and all those uh, violin books, and that's what I played up until maybe when I was in high school. And so I just played violin, and then the cello player in our high school orchestra, he had started playing uh, rock and roll. He got a uh, old, uh, he got a Fender Stratocaster, and one day at, at the orchestra, he said, uh, "This about when I was a junior, maybe." He says, "Hey, uh, we need a bass player," and I had started actually plunking on the upright bass because the the gal who played bass in the the school jazz band um, thought it was unladylike, and she gave up playing the bass. In those days, there weren't a lot of girls playing bass, nor violin, actually. <clears throat> and, and my dad, he had a saying. He said, women shouldn't be allowed to play the violin. Now, I'm sorry, girls, because there's very good violin. Hillary Hahn, for example. But those were different times in the mid-60s. There was like um, Yasha Heifetz was my idol at that time. <clears throat> but anyway, my friend Gary, the cello player, he said, he knew what I, he saw that I was playing the upright bass. And uh, he said, hey, we need a bass player in our rock band. And I go, well, I don't have a bass guitar. And he says, I have one. Come on over. So we went to his house, and uh, he had a harmony guitar. That, that was the ones you could buy from Sears. And uh, it was either harmony or silver tone, either one. It was a pretty lame, cheap guitar. And he'd chopped grooves in the the nut and the bridge and strung it up with four bass strings that was my first bass guitar i just loved it i thought it was so cool playing and, and get this this is this is a great story 
um, the, the first baseline he showed me, I'll never forget it. It went, went dong, 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 dong. And we I played that to uh, a song called Walking with Mr. Lee. And the sax parts go, they play the melody. So a hundred years later, I'm playing name that tune. <laughs> Georgie. Bernie knows it. Rock this tab. A well, hundred years later. Not really a hundred. Yeah. Wow. That's that's cool. So perfect. So sir. you did. Uh, so you basically play violin and upright bass and bass guitar. Those are the main instruments that you do. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I still. But I, I played a lot of bass guitar over the years, mostly bass guitar up until, oh, say the last twenty years of that, because the the upright bass now. Uh, well, I was playing jazz and things because well, you didn't have to have loud pickups but um when king double bass came along they were making these basses that would you could get them loud really loud and they wouldn't feed back you know because they had so much paint and the fact i have my first king double bass would you like to see it it's lurking over there that's the famous yeah. one all right that that's blaze Okay, I, I named my basses after after women, and this one is is uh, named after Blaze Starr, the stripper who brought Huey Long down in Louisiana, governor of Louisiana. So I'll give you a little bit of. There's a light. Let's blaze. This uh, served a lot of time on the Brian Setzer stage. Notice the chrome tailpiece. That's vintage King Double. <laughs> and there's some uh, special, there's some special uh, things that Jason Burns did. Notice the my signature. Nice. The spaz head signature. They put that on there. So this was actually a, a fairly rare King Double. Um, I think it's only one of this color scheme. Um, there's a lot with that same flame design, uh, but it's serial number four. It was built by Jason Burns in his apartment. Not at not. This is before they uh, opened up a shop. You know, a big workshop. Wow, that was a long time ago. When was that? Uh, you know, it was about like like 19 years ago, maybe, because you're saying uh, I joined the Brian Setzer Orchestra about 19 or 20 years ago. So I was playing, I think I was playing my, my, my German bass, I guess. I think I might only had one bass then. <laughs> and uh, so... Um, I, I met a guy on an airplane that was playing um, oh, in this rap band. I'm trying to think who. And he had a King Double bass. And he, he overheard me talking about that I needed a, a bass. And he says, he says, oh, go see. He stuck his head up and he says, go see King Double bass, Jason Burns. Um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. And uh, Cypress. The band is Cypress Hill. He was the bass player in Cypress Hill. Yep. One of the first guys to have he a. He was also a bass player for uh, one psychobilly band in Europe. I forgot the name of the band, but um, um, but yeah, yeah, I'm I'm blanking out. You know, I'm I'm I have Alzheimer's light. <laughs> Can't remember anything anymore. So uh, well, I don't remember a lot of things. I only remember slab bass stuff. Yeah, yeah, slab bass. Uh, I got another King Double I show you. That's pretty cool. Jason built this sure. for me. Let's see. 
he built it at the workshop because I said I, I kind of wanted a Western base, you know, a little Western flavor um, that wasn't rockabilly. So he built this one. I, he, nothing was free with Jason. You had to pay for things, but he gave me great prices. And uh, this one, uh, it's more Western flavor. You can, you got to see the, I don't know if you can see the, the rope right here around the edge. It's a pin, all pin striped. It looks, yeah. it's a rope. Yeah. And it's all hand painted rope. Uh, and the girl, they had a girl doing the pin striping. And she said, I'll never do one of these again because it's all around the back. It goes all the way around. Um, and um, there's the King King Double Bass logo on the back. Um, I played this one in Rockabilly Riot and some other places. This one has a nice tone, a little better than the red one. Yep. Georgie puts me to shame on the slap thing. <laughs> I just prefer to keep good time. Oh, here's another thing. Another custom, a custom feature. The, uh, the spaz name on the bottom again. Done in rope. Nice. I haven't seen that. I'm surprised I haven't seen that. Yeah, that's all hand painted. They had a girl, like I say, a girl did all, did all the pin striping. All right. Oh, so I mentioned I named my bases after girls. Well, that one's called Dale. After Dale Evans because of the Western flavor. And all the roadies know it. They said, we're playing, you want to play Dale or Blaze today? You know, they, they all got remember the names. Oh, I have another one that's named after uh, Julie Setzer. I call it Boom Boom. You want to see it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Which one is that? This one's, uh, well, you know, I, I named it after her because she's blonde. And um, yep. this bass goes boom, boom, boom. All right. This, and it's a fifth. This is a 1958K, uh, 58 King. Sorry. And I got this one. Oh, I got to tell you the history. I got, I found this one <clears throat> in a church basement in Independence, Missouri, which is a suburb of Kansas City where I used to live. And this happens to be the church head, the world headquarters of the church I attend out here in Woodland Hills. <clears throat> and I was, kind of down in the choir room knocking around and I found this bass and I remembered from when I was a kid in the same choir room and that bass was there this blonde bass it's the there it's hard to at that one so um, they had bought it I think in the 50s um, like I say it's a 58 K a king they bought it in the 50s because they had an orchestra at the church that would play behind the, the choir. Uh, they did the Messiah and things like that. So it's got a huge tone because this is built before pickups and amps and that. So when I saw it, this is about maybe, maybe 20 years ago, I guess I was doing some church camps and things like that. And uh, I just happened to see the bass and it was just in really bad shape. Uh, they hadn't used it for years, and I remember seeing it there before when I was visiting back when I lived in Missouri. And the sound post was all crooked, and and there was a just really bad repair jobs, and the neck looked like it was separating. I said, "How much do you want for this old relic?" And uh, the lady said, "Well, make us an offer." And I said, "50 bucks." And she said, "Okay." <laughs> so. Oh really? Wow. I'll be burning in hell for that deal. I'm no, but I do play in my church band for free, so it kind of works out. Anyway, here's here's a boom boom. All 
All right, boom, 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 barks like a cannon. I don't know if you can tell, but it has a huge tone. It's blonde. It's beautiful. Uh, Jason uh, made this black bridge for it. I thought that was very cool. He did a little bit of work on it. Uh, some cool things about right. this bass. The decals are in wonderful shape. Almost like perfect shape. There's one there. And that, that pinstriping is either a decal or, or hand-painted. Um, there's the decal is on the, still on the tailpiece in really nice condition. So is that King Moreton? What say? Is that King Moreton? I didn't understand. What do you say? No, it's painted or it's a uh. decal. That emblem. Oh, okay. But yeah. is it is it uh, King Moreton? Oh, maybe maybe so. Moreton. Yeah, the brand. It's hard. You know what? Let me see if I can find something in the F hole. Okay. You know, no label. No label. So, I, I guess it is. I don't know what okay. the, it does have the violin corners and things like that. So maybe so. And it does sound great. All right. That's boom, boom. Chuck Garner is asking if you have a favorite of your bases. The favorite. Oh, uh, well, the, I, t I tell you my best, the one that the bass I use mostly through the years is, um, and I recorded the first albums with Brian on it. It was uh, my German bass. It's a Hornsteiner, uh, about 150 mm -hmm. years old now. I got it. I, I call it, uh, let's see, uh, <laughs> uh, Bertha, because it's German. This is Bertha. That's Bertha to you Americans, <laughs> not Bertha. This one has a nice sustain. Uh, steel strings on this one. Um, it's all carved top. Nothing's unusual. Except, uh, I've had the top. I, I do some work on my own bases. I've had the top off of this one about three or four times because it was my only bass for years. And, and uh, I think I started playing rockabilly with it and, and putting cracks on it, just knocking it around. The, uh, so, but... Probably this is my the first one I bought when I moved out to LA. Berta. All right, Berta. <laughs> uh, There's one left. So we, we got lots of lots of comments in the meantime. Claudia Corte, she wrote, "Hi, John, Ed, and Claudia here from Independence. I love oh, your sweat." Yeah. They're probably members. Oh yeah, there they are. It said Claudia Ed. Ed was the drummer in uh, my high school band. Hey Ed. <laughs> oh wow, cool. He wasn't a drummer. Sorry, he's a drummer now. He played sax then. In fact, he would relate to. Uh, -da 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 -da. We had two saxes, uh, two guitars, uh, drums, bass. That was a great band. It's just the two saxes oh. out, man. We do steps. The All whole right, Ed. Hope you're still 
McLean, Sachs, Androns. Um, Larsen is here from Sweden. Uh -huh. And Mad Twins are here from Ukraine. And they wanted to know how was it to work with Chris de Rosario. Oh, they saw I, you on tour with Riot in Germany 2011. And two double bases on stage were cool. Oh, God. Chris was so much fun. He was he was like, I'd say, Chris, you're like the son I never had. And, he got, and I go, wait a minute. I got two sons already. So we were, it was a laugh fest when, when I was working with him. I remember he was kind of new on the band and we'd done a gig or two and we were uh, taking a bus tour around Europe. And uh, uh, we were checking into a hotel. You know how that goes. They got to deal with the front desk. And meanwhile, I went to the little restaurant where they had some uh, rolls, you know, some sweet rolls and things like that. And I got a coffee and uh, Chris uh, came in. I, I said, hey, have a seat, man. So he sat down and and I says, you want some? Help yourself. So uh, he says, really? okay. I says, yeah, sure, help yourself. So he reaches out and I go, not that one, <laughs> really loud. <laughs> And he about had a heart attack, so that became a running gag for the whole uh, the whole tour. And then uh, we also had this fantasy about uh, whether well, the whole band became uh, locked into this fantasy of having a uh, a, a sled or a, or some kind of wagon or or buggy, and instead of horses, we'd have a team of of women hot looking babes okay maybe scantily clad with with some kind of high boots or something like that and then so all tour long we're checking out the windows of cars and buses hey there's one for the team <laughs> chris I, I hope chris is watching oh boy it seems that you guys are having lots of fun on that tour how did that happen that, that brian brought two bass players on that tour you know the the show was it was like two shows. The first half of the show was all um, Stray Cat stuff. I'm sorry. The first half of the show was all vintage rockabilly. And it was myself. I'm vintage. Look at me. Uh, it was myself on bass, Noah Levy on drums, who had a, a brown sport coat and a bow tie. And he hated the outfit. But I said, man, you look cool. That's really really vintage look so we were trying he was uh, trying to get the vintage vibe feel of uh, the days when people wore ties and suits so uh and uh, kevin mckendry on piano so we did uh, all of the old time rockabilly stuff uh, it's a little bit of johnny cash and stuff like that so then uh, uh they we would take a break and slim jim would come on the stage and and Chris, Chris de Rosario. <clears throat> so that they did this, the last half of the show. And then um, near the end of their set, Chris would be taking a bass solo. And I would come out with a bass. I'd sneak up behind him and he'd look at me like this. And I'd start doing my, my trick. So we were going back and forth, battling each other. And then finally we would get to this position where I would be fingering notes and he would be slapping my strings and I would be slapping his bass. So we had our, our hands crossed somehow and we were just going, doing the triple sap. I'll show you that. Uh, I will use this one. I call it the, the neck knock. So we're both doing the neck knock, which is like this. Can you see? Slap, hit, hit. And so I'm maybe slapping his bass, and he's, you know what I'm saying, we're doing that, both of us are doing that rhythm. Just going into a frenzy. The crowd's going crazy, crazy at that moment. And then here comes Brian carrying a bass over his head like this. He comes up. And we just like stop, dead cold, dead stop. What? And we look at him, and he starts going. 
He starts doing the the rock this town lick, and he plays. He he got so that he could play about three or four choruses of of a blues, and then he would go like this, and then we'd start back into our big finale. It was a it was a big hodgepodge. I love that show. That was so great. Yeah, I miss it. I don't. I, I don't think that I've seen you. Maybe I've seen you. I did see that show actually. Like that, we played. I played with Drake Bell uh, as a support oh, yeah. act for one of your shows uh, at Kodak Dolby Theater, right? Uh, you, what, we did the Ryman, right? I think Ryman or right or, but. I think no, I mean in Los Angeles, uh, Dolby, Dolby Kodak. Oh, it might have been the Universal Amphitheater too when that was still there. But Dolby, yeah, you're right. Dolby, I I, I played uh, Dolby with uh, when we were supporting supporting the orchestra. Yeah, and now I remember we actually seen that show. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I got uh, Matt Twins. Wrote Noah and Kevin are great guys, best rockabilly riot lineup, and um, so cool. <laughs> it's so great, like to see all these people here, you know, joining us. You oh, know, yeah. please, love love you, so much. Uh, you know, if you have questions for Spaz or yeah. me, you see me every Saturday, so I'm not that it's not that ex 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 it's not a big exclusivity, like Spaz is. Now the star. Uh, so if you have questions for Spaz, please write them down in a live chat on the side. Uh, if you if you'd like to support the channel, check out if you want like your comment featured. There's a um, super chat and super stickers right under the uh, live chat. Uh, how did you get that that nickname, Spaz? Oh, um, I was playing in a band called Big Daddy. Who, who is now kind of, they've kind of reformed. They were an eight-piece 50s band of all different character looks. Uh, they had the, the drummer wear, wear a mouseketeer hat. Uh, he was cub. He had a cubby shirt. We had a white sport coat, pink carnation guy. We had a, an Elvis guy kind of with a uh, gold lame with lightning bolts down the leg. And, uh, and then there was a, a beatnik, beatnik piano player, you know, with the cigarette holder and the beret. And um, so it wasn't a uniform band. We were creating different looks. So I said, well, what can I, what can I do? So I say, well, I'm the only guy wearing glasses. So, okay, I'll be the band nerd. Um, so, hey, hey, my name is, uh, hey. you know, and they, they call me Johnny Rocket Chip, I think, for a while. And then, when we had a show in uh, in um, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe at the Harris, Harris Tahoe <clears throat> Lounge Act, and uh, so I they they uh, let me do one number in the act, and I would uh, do. Uh, ooh, I'm trying to think of what the song was. Uh, maybe it was Staggerly, but anyway, uh, I would. By me, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the band nerd, I would grab the microphone and mess with it. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen Jar George Carl's act. Look him up, George Carl, C-A-R-L. But he would mess with the microphone, and it would be going up and down, and you try it. So I would do some of these things. And then when I was uh, doing the number, I would kind of run around the stage and goof off and trip over things. And so the... the uh, the stage hands started calling me Spaz. <laughs> That's how it started. Of course, the band latched onto it right away. Wow, uh, and how long ago was that? Well, I would say 30 years or more, maybe, probably. Uh, oh, okay. All right. So at least 10, 10 years before you joined Brian. Yeah, probably so. But now at, at, at that band was probably together for at least I was with them for maybe 10 years or more or maybe nine or 10. But it, 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 and eventually but, uh, the sax 
chair opened up and Bob Sandman got the gig. Now, if you guys know Sandman, he was on the original sax section in the BSO, Brian Setzer Orchestra. And eventually, well, this is in the days when the or the BSO was heavy party band, heavy, heavy, heavy drugs, heavy liquor, just up every night a party. And there's rumors that uh, if you didn't party hardy, you might risk being fired from that band. So uh, things are changed now. Okay, everybody's uh, on an even keel, but. And I heard stories about the old days. But uh, anyway, eventually, um, Sandman got to be music director of the BSO. So since he knew me, he would call me for things in L.A. Because at that time, the bass player was Mark Winchester, who lived in Nashville. So there were things in L.A. They didn't need to fly Mark out. And so the Sandman would say, hey, Spaz, we got a we had a gig, you know, or can you come and help audition a piano player, for example? We, I did that one time. And then um, he knew that I slapped a little bit because uh, of the, the gig and Big Daddy. So that's kind of how it uh, evolved into me getting the gig. Um, I remember they had, uh, there were two gigs that I did with the band before I was a permanent member, maybe three. But I remember the first one was... Uh, and Bernie was on it. Bernie was on all of these. The first one was uh, the at the Hollywood Hard Rock, and it was a lawyers' convention of some sort. So we uh, we the, you know we met in the dressing room, and, and people said, "Oh, well, where's the here's the base book, Spaz?" Okay, and then we put our charts in order. And in those days, you didn't practice or rehearse. You had to know how to read so which i did you know i've read big band charts and well the lead that goes back to the elvis show we can talk about that later but anyway they hand me the book and i put it in order and i took to go outside uh, into this onto the stage and uh, get ready to play and pretty soon now i'd never played in this band before and i'd played in a lot of big bands which were like do 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 right but this band was right away. I go, holy cow. I, you know, my ears were killing me because I'm right next to Bernie. Bernie. And uh, I'm reaching for the earplugs between songs. But there's no space where, man, bam, segue into the next song. Ah, put the earplug on the bands, on the music stand. Read down the chart. Uh, okay, next I pull the other earplug out. So, okay, right. So about three songs into it, I finally get the earplugs. In. By the way, kids, always wear earplugs. If you get used to it after a while, but I still have my hearing. A little bit of tinnitus, very faint. I have to think about it. But um, maybe you know that Brian canceled the tour from the year ago because of serious tinnitus. And, uh, and his wife said it's a whirring sound. I asked her, what does he hear? So uh, I, I recommend them. I wear, I've been wearing them for, well, ever since the Big Daddy days. Uh, so that's 35, 40 years I've been wearing earplugs. And it saved my hearing, I'm pretty sure. But I just remember I couldn't get them in fast enough. Oh, and then we're turning pages and we come to the chart. And it's got this brown paint spatters, like, like somebody took a toothbrush and went, you know, spattered paint. So I asked the keyboard player at the end of the show, I said, what's this paint all of? He says, no, that's not paint. That's blood. I go, blood? Yeah, he says, our bass player's fingers exploded in uh, in um, Europe. I guess they were the first European tour, maybe. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, the sax players had all, oh, the whole band had white, white sport coats. So their white sport coats had paints bloody paint splatters all over the back of their their uh, sport coats so i heard but that was my first gig with brian said wow. the show they must have been fun and so that was probably 2001 um burning i know uh, but it was we did another gig we played a gig at the the guy who 
invented the Mossimo shirts. And he had a big house down mm -hmm. on Laguna. That was quite a fun party. Everybody had to dress 70s. And they had a huge wardrobe tent. We came to the party, went to the wardrobe tent, changed clothes. We didn't have to do that, but ever, all the guests were wearing 70s, you know, bell bottoms, ruffled shirts. Bernie, Bernie was on that one too. And there was one more that I did uh, in San Diego. It was for the, who, the guy, Gap Blue Jeans, I think. Gap Jeans, yeah. And I remember they had some dancers or something. But that, well, those were the three gigs that I did um, just because. Before you joined the band. So then when Mark retired, I got the job. I got the offer. That's so cool. That's great. And um, why do you think that, what was the main reason that you got the, the, the job? Because you knew those people and you played before or you were well, reading skills? I, you had to read for one. And then, um, you know, I, I just knew the, the bag because I'm playing the, the 50s and, and Big Daddy. And uh, played upright. So that was part of the deal, playing upright. I played the German bass. Where is it? There it is. Bertha. Bertha was the first bass. And then uh, shortly after that, I met Jason through that guy in the airplane, the guy played in uh, Cypress Hill. <laughs> they had an upright player. I guess he played real fundamentals because it was, you know, Cypress Hill was all disco. disco. He's actually an actor as well. His name is Christian... Uh, I'm yeah. not sure how to pronounce his Christian. name. Last name yeah. is Christian Ford Belber or something like that, and he was a he was a bass player in one psychobilly band from Belgium. Oh, I do not recall the name of the band. It's something Rats. I I, I can't I cannot remember at, at at the moment. Maybe some of our psychobilly viewers can um, write down in the comments. Yeah, and I, I do not recall the name of the band, but the, but the guy's name is Christian. He lives down in Venice, uh, and he was he was actually he's actually mostly a guitar player. He plays with Fear Factory. He played bass with uh, Cypress Hill. So like he's a metalhead. He plays metal uh, electric guitar. Yeah, and it was such a weird meeting. We were in the in an airplane getting out of our seats to go off and. He goes, hey, I heard you talking about bass. Or somehow he overheard me, you know. And you got to go see this guy, Jason Burns. I don't know if he had his number or what, but that's how it started. Yeah, they, they, they've been friends for, for a long time. I know that once I, I, I brought a bass to, <laughs> to Christian because I was living in Santa Monica, very close to him. And I was at the Jason's all yeah, the time. Yeah, so. Georgia, you built your own bass down at the... King Double Bass Factory. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I didn't build it. You know, I told uh, Jason what I would like to have, and I told him my ideas about a pickup, and then that's how he started working on that, and um, and he made it. I brought him uh, an ebony from one uh, German village. You know, that's where I always buy my ebony fingerboards, and I always play ebony fingerboards. So I brought that one, so he put it on, on the his regular 145, and he put the pickup that I that we kind of designed together. I mean, it was my idea, but he made it happen, him and Martin. So now that's Georgia's signature pickup, yeah. and I'm really happy with that bass. I love that bass. He's building me a new one, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Wait a minute. I'm in line first. <laughs> He's building me one too, but we've been waiting two years. I had a, I had a friend who uh, who gave him the money. I got a millionaire friend. I used to give this guy guitar lessons when he was uh, 12, I think. And his, he, he, he uh, hooked up with me on MySpace. Remember that? MySpace? Oh, He's, yeah. He says, he's typing. He, he says, I'm the the kid that used to take lessons from you in Kansas City, and my dad always smelled like alcohol. And I go, oh, yeah, I remember that. But I also remember that you were pretty good, you know, on the guitar. So he eventually, <clears throat> I think his wife inherited a, a huge fortune or something. So he says, I'm going to buy you a bass. So he's giving Jason the money. So 
We got to rub that in now. Come on, Jason. Let's deliver now. So I've been talking to Jason about, you know, seafoam green because uh, <clears throat> I've got some uh, DNA speakers that are seafoam green. We looked all over for Tolex that was seafoam green. We found it. Hey, that's so oh. only Tolex seafoam green DNA speakers. DNA, by the way, I got a. So that's going to, be, going to be a Christmas base, huh? It's going to be green? Yeah, I think so. It's going to be green for the next tour. Oh, okay. Hope he gets it ready by because there may be a 2021 tour. Um, factors. Oh, there will be? Like, do you, do you have any shows booked with Brian? Well, no, I had, don't have anything booked, but uh, one of our girl singers called the, one of the bus drivers because we like our bus drivers and so we keep in touch. And we get the same one every year. And he said, well, you guys have reserved buses for 2021. So, oh, cool. It's a good sign. <laughs> I don't know. Right, I'm going to see you. Man, who knows? Slapping. Slapping with Brian. Um, you have more friends here joining us. Richard Andrews. Oh, yeah. Hey, John. Richard here from Florida. Looking good. Have known Johnny since 1971. That's right. The good old days. Richard was uh, one of the other guitar teachers at uh, this this the store of Jenkins Music, North Kansas City. Yeah, they're great people. They escaped to Florida. Uh, they escaped Missouri. Oh yeah. Well, you when, when did you move to the, uh, Los Angeles? Um, I got. Uh, it was probably er, er, early seventies. Uh, I was permanent here in seventy four. But I, I got a, a gig touring with a jazz pianist named uh, Gene Harris. He's fairly famous. Mm. He had, at the time, he had 50 albums on Blue Note. This was probably 72, maybe. About the time I played the Elvis show, which I'll talk about later if you'd like. But anyway, uh, he, he, it was a great tour. It was great music. He's a fantastic pianist. He passed away, though, about 10 years ago. But he's kind of like a Ramsey Lewis cross with Oscar Peterson. It was just great music. Um, powerful arms. He, he had arms bigger than my leg, man. He just, he'd just he tear pianos up. And pull, he'd be playing along, and he'd reach and pull a string out because the string had broken. It was rattling. He'd be... <laughs> yeah. uh, and the very fine drummer, Carl Burnett, who's still in Los Angeles, <clears throat> taught me a lot about time. He says, time isn't a bang, 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 bang. He says, time is where you're all bang, bang, bang in your head. But da da ding ding but da boom bing ba da boom boom bang, bing And then but you get it. so it, it was more here than ka, ka, ka. So... I did learn a lot from Carl Burnett about that. <clears throat> but anyway, we toured the Chitlin circuits, they call it. A lot of black nightclubs, wonderful people. They supported the music. Um, they they weren't always the greatest clubs in as far as decor. I remember one stage we on had a yellow bug bulb plugged in. That was our stage lighting and some neon neon lights in, in rain gutters going around the sides. Nevertheless, um, wonderful music. We had some really great clubs too. There was a nice club in Denver. And uh, so Gene lived in Los Alamitos, a suburb of uh, LA down in Orange County. So uh, he tried to keep us working. Uh, he'd book two weeks, two weeks here, two weeks there. And, uh, but sometimes we'd have a week or two off. So at that time, but my wife and I had bought a motor home because here's what would happen. We'd get to a town and Gene's wife would get on the payphone, the nearest, the first payphone outside of town and start calling hotels. Now she was white and Gene being black, they would know that he was black and say, sorry, no vacancy, sir. But she, she would make the calls and book us the hotels. So, uh, and when we check in, Gene would wait in the car. And uh, so at that time we were still, you know, I first got on that tour, we were still staying in the motels too, but they weren't the, the fanciest hotels. They were, I don't know, four 
not four stars and more like a, a half a star maybe <clears throat> one night we woke up to go to the bathroom and there's something like 16 cockroaches i remember that number we counted them holy cow they're all on the far wall just hanging out <clears throat> so we decided to you know invest in maybe a motor home or something so my wife's uh, uh brother-in-law had a car dealership so he trade we traded a chevy van and i had a an mgb gt uh, 67 i think wish i had that car now but we traded it for this motor home and we had you know our payments were lower they were lower than what we were paying for these uh, flop houses so we on our weeks off we had we had the motor home we're in la so at the at that time the marina del rey wasn't built up there was a lot of land there right where the main channel goes out to the ocean you people from la and there was no condos none of that was built up there were some few oil wells so that's where we park our motorhome we got a great view of the channel watch sailors go in and out and on the weekends it was the people going to the beach i i I'd put my folding chair up on the roof. There was like a hatch that opened. I'd sit there and get some cops some rays and, and enjoy the weather. So uh, it, we decided, oh, we started meeting musicians. <clears throat> Remember, uh, we had bicycles, so we'd ride around. <clears throat> we rode from the marina down to Redondo. And there was a <clears throat> bar there called uh, uh, the, the Portofino Inn. <clears throat> and uh, we were just riding through the parking lot one afternoon <clears throat> and there's this guy carrying a bass in a bag you know a ba uh, bass guitar hey i'm a bass player too you know missouri go hey i'm a bass player too so he says yeah come on in and hear our band tonight so we saw the band it was stan worth uh, and scott page was in the band um for, i think uh who scott page later later a sax player was super tramp uh, Stan Worth also was a writer of George of the Jungle, Hoppity Hooper, uh, Boris Badenoff, all those cartoons. He wrote all the music for that. So uh, <clears throat> he was quite well to do. And uh, so his brother had been studying chiropractic. He was a bass player, Stan's brother. So uh, they said, hey, you want to sit in? Sure. All right. I played a you know, half a dozen tunes or so, and they had charts. I thought that was impressive because bands and, you know, club bands in Kansas City didn't have music. They just played, you know. So I said, wow, those guys are reading. I was real impressed. So um, I sat and played a few songs and uh, said said our hellos and goodbyes and met, met shook hands and whatnot. And uh, at one time, Gene Harris uh, had... Uh, well, he'd used me on an album that's called Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. And he decided to do a second album, but he didn't use me. And I didn't get it. I didn't understand what the L.A. situation was because he hired. And it wasn't his say. It wasn't his call to hire session guys uh, to do his second album. Like, uh, oh, God, I'm trying to think of who all he used. But basically the more names you got on your album the more likely it would be to sell he was on blue note like i said 50 50 albums or so so i got real bummed out you know and kind of hot-headed why am i doing this i'm wasting all this time out here and he's not using me on the the record so we moved back to kansas city two months go by and i get a call from stan worth he goes hey you want the gig my brother's moving to tahoe uh, so, yeah, so by that time we didn't made a lot of friends and um, luckily I had a gig to go to because a lot of people come out to L.A. with $600 in a guitar case and uh, starve for three years until they get known. So right away I was working, doing sessions. We played uh, TV themes and whatnot. So anyway, enough about me. That's how I got to uh, permanent residence here in LA in 74. That's a, that's so cool. Um, I mean, those are crazy stories. Those are different times. And uh, it's cool that you you mentioned Portofino. I like that place. That place is still around. Yeah, it's still there recently. They had a bar. 
they had a waitress named Boom Boom. Yeah. <laughs> For obvious reasons, that was her nickname. Her name is uh, oh, okay. Marion Bouja, and, and her her boyfriend produced the first. Uh, uh, oh God, what was it called? Um, oh, the first movie where there's a lot of car crashes and stuff. Oh, what was it called? Oh, uh, anyway, because he owned a junkyard and he could afford to crash cars. I'll think of the names. Mm, okay. Uh, what is the name of your first band? Your first band was in, in, in Missouri, in St. Louis, right? Yeah, the Marauders. It was the Marauders. Marauders was the name of the first band. Okay. Yep. And uh, bands were named after cars, you know, the, the Mercuries. The, so the Mar Marauder was a Mercury, the Mercury and Marauder. So we were the Marauders. Okay. Have you, you played on, on, on Brian Setzer's song we are the marauders right i don't think so don't remember that one i don't think so. that might have been before you joined the band yeah because i remember that he he, he had a, a a song called we are the marauders yeah uh, dedicated with some other band uh the first but bernie played on it bernie's on it yeah the yeah, first bernie's on it first sessions i did were the christmas stuff yeah Ah, okay. The first, the first Christmas. You're on all Christmas albums, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, all the Christmas albums. Uh, there's a couple of tunes here and there were different bass players, but like just one or two, maybe over all the four. Mm -hmm. But there was uh, actually an album before that that Bernie and I worked on uh, at Village Recorder. Um, and they told me, they said, you know, we're going to repl replace all your parts with Mark Winchester because he was a regular guy. But apparently they didn't replace them all. So I'm on something on the, on, and I think they made a, it featured on Best of the Big Bands. And I forget, what was the name of that album, Bernie? Uh, I think that Bernie, oh, oh, Bernie left. He, he said I, that he had to teach an yeah. online course. Yeah, I think it was Vavoom. Ah, Vavoom? Okay. Vavoom, yeah. So the one, that's the first album that you're on, on, on yeah. Brian. I think I'm on that. They said I wasn't, but maybe I am. I think I, I got a gold <laughs> record from Japan for being on it. <laughs> oh, cool. That, you, that's that's, that's, that's interesting. How, how did you get interested in Slap a Bass? Well, um, when I was playing in that band Big Daddy, I, I started dabbling in in slap bass, and I'm trying to think why, why I did that. Um, oh no, just started doing it. <laughs> trying to think if there were influences that influenced. That was that was still back in back in St. Louis. Oh, you know what? I I was I believe it was okay. It's a slap bass. I know what it was. Uh, the Bill Haley song, um, "Rock Around the Clock." Rock around the clock. You listen to that bass tone, and everybody thought that was a drummer clicking the side of the snare. Tick to tick to tick to tick. Oh, tick, really? Tick, and people still do. I'm pretty sure that's not the drummer, kids. The drummer's going rock, touch, sizzle, 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 pa da, pop, sizzle, 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 da 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 da, sizzle, sizzle, tinka, 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 tinka. That's the bass, the most killer bass tone ever on a recording. Except maybe mine. That was Marshall Idol on those recordings, Rock Around the Clock with Bill Haley. And um, uh, I had the pleasure to interview Marshall a few years ago, like maybe even 10 years ago, and it's on artofslapbase.com. Marshall was super kind, and he answered 50 questions of mine. So go man, to artofslapbase.com and check it out. I'm going to check that out right away. His base is in. You haven't? I thought that you did. No? I, I'll, I'll, I will now. Oh. Okay, all right. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, so, so you said that you don't remember what was the reason that you started playing slap bass. Well, I think 
I just remember doing it in the Big Daddy Man. Maybe just because it was a because of Mark. It was a '50s kind of band, and maybe the guy said, "Hey, try slapping or psycho." I can't remember. I just remember that's that's where I started slapping, and ah, okay. Eventually, it led to the gig with Setzer because, like I say, Bob Sandman, the sax player, was the music director for a minute, so he knew I slapped. And, but I remember my first slap, first gigs. We, uh, I think it was a Japanese tour, maybe. And my fingers were like hammered. There were blisters right away. And I, as soon as I'd get off the stage, I'd, I'd stick my hands into the the ice, you know, where the beer was. Only the ice was there too. Oh God, this is this cooling. You know, they were so. Uh, but uh, and I was taping them up. <clears throat> By the way, tape your fingers if you get a sight, even a sign of a blister. Don't let it get to be a blister. Because then it's a drag. So tape up your finger. Start at the tips and spiral up past the knuckle, past the big knuckle. Because if you don't, I, a couple of times I'd just tape the tips. And I'd be slapping away. Boom. Oh, there goes my bandage into the sack section. You know, they try to catch it. <laughs> so you got to go past the knuckle and then kind of flex your fingers while you're, while you're taping and use that white tape. Which which tape are you using for to to tape your fingers? Well, it's just like surgical tape they call it. So it's just um, like you know, it's about that wide. You get it at the drugstore, surgical tape. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was there, there were there was some talk like which tape is the best. You know, I I also used some kind of cold coach tape. You know, by Johnson and Johnson or something. Yeah, from exactly. Walgreens. Uh, I heard that uh, that uh, Lee Rocker would use gaffer's tape. <laughs> use anything, oh. whatever. But you got to start at the tips and overlap as you go up. If you start at the thing and go down, all the edges are exposed to the string and it'll yank it off. Uh, and so, so you basically played slap just in uh, one band before the so so the, the name of the band was big daddy right big daddy yeah they're on rhino records um uh, it's hard to find oh. the records they're, they're getting expensive they're on vinyl but i'm sure they have cds uh, out now um of everything and then and then in between big daddy and brian setzer orchestra you haven't played slap bass almost at all well no now once i once I, once I got known as a slap bass player, I, there's a lot of club gigs in L.A. The Bernie's play, played gigs with me down at uh, Joe's Great American Bar and Grill, which was a great dance club. I told uh, Trey, the owner, I said, man, this is the best honky-tonk, uh, you know, west of the Mississippi. The, the other one is uh, Robert's Western World in Nashville. That's a great club. Hmm. And that's where Slick Joe Fick plays. I go there and bow at his yeah. feet. I worship at his feet. He's the <laughs> Slick Joe Fick. I don't know. Georgie, you and he are probably in the same slap bag. You know, you're just monsters at that, whatever that is. I just make a point to play good time mostly. Boom, ba -ta, ba -ta, ba -ta, ba -ta, you know. Lock in with the drummer. You throw a lot of pockets. The pocket is the most important. Yep. But hopefully, you know, bass players are, are here to keep the drummers in line. Right, Oh, right? yeah, absolutely. He's gone, probably. Um, I always yell at drummers. So, play with me, man. You know, I have. Before, before Brian Setzer Orchestra, you, you played Slap uh, only with Big Daddy, or you played with some other bands? before Brian Setzer, before you joined Brian? Well, there were a lot of lot of bands that I was working and playing bass guitar. I did a ton of weddings. My God, that paid for my, okay. my, my made my house payment, car payment, put my kids through school, playing joint nice. weddings, you know, and things like that. Uh, but on, mostly on the, the Fender. Sometimes I'd take both basses, oh. you know, just, but it wouldn't be slap more, it'd be more like, uh, you know, so the sun, boom, 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 you know, like walking bass or Dean Martin kind of stuff. 
Go we ahead. have Sasha Belgrade. He wrote uh, Big Daddy got one EP record with Ray Campy as the guest. This is true. That was their, their first uh, their first album, Big Daddy, before I joined the band. Their first album had Ray Campy on it. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm on there. So that was before before your time. Yep, yep. And it, they had really put the band together as a show band. They just they were just a session. It was just a recording session. Uh, one of the members owned a studio called Sunburst down in Culver City. Uh -huh. Really popular studio. It was kind of a yeah, it was great. He was getting Cleos. We were doing uh, commercials out of there and doing sound alike records for Rhino. Rhino would want the best of Louie Louie, all the versions of Louie Louie, and sometimes they couldn't get the like the 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 original artist. The record company wouldn't allow them to use the track, so we'd duplicate it. You know, sound alike. So that was one of the things that we recorded at that studio. <clears throat> but That's it, interesting. I remember going to the audition and I greased my hair back with I use Vaseline. Never use Vaseline on your hair. Never use I didn't know. You know, I just it took a week or two to get that out of there, man. But I put the cigarette in my shoulder. I wanted the gig bad. I thought it was the most hysterical album I'd ever seen. So I got the gig, and they talk about that. They still do do shows around LA. They fired me though, so I. Eh. And, and when Big Daddy was uh, working a lot at a place called At My Place in Santa Monica, but it was a it was a night, supper club or a nightclub, and the best we could do is maybe eighty bucks a man. So it came around that I joined this other band called the Ho Dads <clears throat> and we were doing private parties and we'd come home with 600 bucks a piece in our pocket. So I would sub it out, which is, you know, what you do in LA. If you got a better gig, you try to give your friend your gig, you take my gig, I'll go do this gig. And then you share stuff. The guys in big daddy didn't get it. You know, they were not really that, type of musicians they wanted a commitment you know commitment what oh i have to commit to feeding my family you know so they fired me but they hired my sub because i would always send a good sub so huh. anyway i'm not a part of the the current big big daddy but they're still out there doing shows around they're hysterical <clears throat> so after the big daddy you joined hodads Yep, the Hodad's a party band. We still exist as a band. Uh, uh, we did very well. We do, did uh, a lot of summer concerts in the park. That was a big summer thing for us, Fourth of mm -hmm. July concerts. It's a band of excellent musician, five-piece band. Um, then the pandemic came along. But we have a website, hodads.com. And Hodad's means... Uh, non-surfer. So we started out as a surf band, but we ended up doing everything, disco, you name it, whatever ah. the gig offer. Very talented musicians. Do you slap on that album? On uh, that band? That band? I, I do. I, sometimes I take both bases, and sometimes we do, uh, we have a thing called the Spazabillies, which is an offshoot of that band. And it's me, the guitar player, and the drummer, you know, when this budget's small and they want a 50s. So, uh, I'll take the upright bass, the red one, and slap. Yes, I do slapping in that. <clears throat> hey, cool. I, I, uh, any things that you would like to mention besides uh, Brian Setzer and Big Daddy where you're slapping? Well, um, let's see. Uh, just L.A. Lots of really good clubs in L.A. If you're ever out here, try when the you know now they're all closed but those are uh, there's a lot of great clubs the cicada club downtown la another one with vintage music be sure to wear a coat and tie guys you won't get in uh girls gowns um there's a lot of slap bass there not always 
Sometimes they want vintage 50s and 40s. Um, so uh, Spikes, I don't know if Spikes is still there. There's the Barkley in South Pasadena. Very nice supper club with vintage music and jazz and acoustic basses. Um, yep, that's it. There's We can rebel against the disco and the bullshit. Sorry. Oh, it's Sunday. Oh, sorry. With the BS that's out there. The music that is hateful with stupid lyrics and uh, don't it's just noise pollution in my book. Uh, you know, let's listen to music that's uplifting. You know, I, I get in my car. I get in my my Mustang, 88 Mustang uh, 5.0, and it's got USC playing, the symphony station. Because why? You can't find any good music on the radio. So you listen to classical music. That's another one on my list. Oh, speaking of which... I have my symphony bass with me. Where is it? <clears throat> ah. First, we did a close-up of this bad action. Look at that. That's a mechanical C extension. Here's a better look at it. That allows me to play low C and uh, the way it works, let me try to move this up here so you can see the, the gizmo. You, you finger it here. See these little levers right there? Boom, boom, boom. Now notice when I'm pushing the first finger, this one works. I push the second finger, that one works. So it's reverse. You go one, you go one two, three, four like that, and the pitch lowers. So if you went one, two, three, four here, the pitch would get higher. So that's the really, I say get one that's a that's already a five string, but it goes down to low C. But it's, I use this bass mainly for arco. I ra rarely pizzicato. Uh, I don't even have a pickup on it. It's a it's a Carlo Robelli, which is Sam Ash line. They're made in China, but this just happened to have a massive tone, and uh, it's very pretty. Nice uh, carved. It's a carved top, made in China, but it's a has a huge tone, and I, I play it uh, in a couple of symphonies. One is the the main one's the, uh, the Palisade Symphony. I've been playing with them off and on for like forty years. <clears throat> um, sometimes uh, I would just go play the concert and get there a couple hours early <laughs> and read the read the charts and try to lay out one. I didn't know what was going on, but lately we we've been rehearsing once once a week, and he puts a concert on maybe uh, every two months. Uh, Palisade Symphony, but those are all. <laughs> Pandemic? Do you do you rehearse with them even this year? Oh, pandemic shut that uh, shut it all down. But when that comes back, I also played with the San Fernando Symphony, uh, subbing with subbing for the ba one of the bass players, and it was two rehearsals and show. <laughs> so you get to take the music home and shed it. But because I, because my first instrument was violin, I'm very good at the bow. I use a French bow. Because that's what, that's more cello and violin style of bow. I don't have one here with me, but. And uh, let's see, other symphonies. Yeah, there's a bunch of them around the LA that are non professional, non paying, but are great. Like the Doctor's Symphony. Get this, the Doctor's, but they'll hire anybody <laughs> to come in and play because I know a lot of people who play in that and aren't doctors. Yeah. Hey, you know, I, people are requesting people are requesting the, some slap. So, which bass are you going to use, like, to slap something for us? Oh, you, you let the people pick. Here, take a look. Well, let's see. 
Let me get it in the shot. There's the there's the girls, everybody. Can they see them all? All right. So what do you want to play? Well, I I I, I can slap uh, that one, this one, all the uh, the yellow one has guts. I actually can slap the Hornsteiner. That's the first one I recorded with with Brian. It it records great. But it's got steels on them. The uh, all right, whatever you want to choose, you know, let us know what you want to play, and let's slap it. We all want to hear you slap. Or uh, whatever you want to play, really. I'm gonna go play Dale. All right, this is Dale. Everybody named after Dale Evans. Let's move down. You can see a little bit of Dale's body. Name my bases after girls. I'll play a blues and B flat. Uh, I gotta gotta get the knee in it. I drooled on myself just now. Look at that. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty basic, huh? Just keep good time. You know, they'll love you forever. You know, yeah, I, I, good time is all we care about. I've That's had our purpose. I, I've had drummers tell me, can you quit doing that? Because <laughs> they want to go ding to ding to ding, you know. But so it's just be aware of the music. Oh, my first lick. Okay, you know the words to that one. Rock this town. It was my first bass lick ever back in the high school on the electric bass. The old harmony with the carved nut. Let's see. All right, in the park. I'm rusty. Double stops. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I'm totally Sounds embarrassed. Cool, man. I love doing double stops. That's a, that's, I love doing double stops. Uh, double. See, Larson wrote, love it. Stefan wrote, thanks. So, you know. <laughs> some of the people some of the time hey they probably uh, see a little red base because that was that was the icon well, okay this is uh this is blaze my first king double based 
named after Blaze Star, the stripper. And the axe is a little lower now. These strings are almost flat. Notice how less the bridge. So these got to check these strings out. They're, they're worn down to the copper. <laughs> I've had them on so long. These are innovation golden slaps. They never break. Look at there. These things have been on there I don't know how long. And I think people may make a big deal about new strings. Not on slap bass, no. You want dead strings, you know. All right, that's Blaze. Chrome tailpiece, vintage King double bass. I think there might be only be one made like it. You know, you have a request from Nick Presser. He asked you to play Wheels on the Train Track. I don't know it. You don't remember that's the one uh, he said that's the one that you played with Setzer. Which one? Wheels on the train track. Never played it. Did I? <laughs> okay. If I played it, I didn't know. I I don't know it by that name. Huh? <laughs> Wheels on the train. Rip. A cool rip. I wonder if it's this one. Okay, this is Berta. Maybe it's this one. Is it that? Oh, this bass sounds so good. This one has such a nice warm tone. I put a, a shadow on it. Those are really great pickups, y'all. Shadow rockabilly pickup. So, uh, shadow, uh, I don't know if for you bass players out there, you may not know that for rockabilly, you got to amplify the slap too. So all a good good rockabilly pickups have a pickup here this one see it's right right there behind the fingerboard. That little silver gizmo. So you need one of those or people won't hear the, the click above the drums or above everything's so dang loud now. You need that pickup plus the one in the bridge. And uh Now, I, I'm a guilty. I use my third finger only because I play violin. We use all of them. So that's a no-no. <laughs> Bass. Use. Uh, I was about to ask you that. I noticed that you were using your third finger when you play the double stops. So you always use third finger, huh? Well, uh, you're not supposed to use it ever. For, use your second. I know that. I know that. So I was surprised to see you play that when you uh, when you played the double pops. So so you're using third finger through the on the whole fingerboard. Yeah, I'm I'm a bad boy. I, I use my sometimes I use it with the second just for strength because my uh, fingers aren't that strong. I remember when I uh, when I switched my major. It was in college. I was playing the. Oh, I don't know if you knew of, I was a concert master of the Missouri All State Orchestra, Youth Orchestra. And uh, that was on violin. And then I was concert master of our university orchestra. And the, and the, the, the conductors noticed that I was playing 
upright bass and a lot of these folk bands and different bands around uh, the campus. And he says, do you think you'd want to change your major? Because they were real short of basses in the orchestra. So that's when I switched uh, my major to bass. And I remember taking my string jury and, they, and the juror said, you're using your third finger. Because <laughs> it's a no-no. You know, symphony is all about first, so there's your whole steps. It's like you don't need the third finger. I said a second finger, I'd put that one. See, it'd be in the same place, but anyway, they they uh, raised eyebrows. I said, well, I'm a violinist. It's hard to break those habits. They go, oh, okay, because I played great, and they still gave me an A. But, but this is the claw, folks. That's a whole step from here to there. And the half step should be your second finger. And that show my book shows you all of that stuff. The rockabilly bass. Yes. You actually have a question about a book from yeah. Jack. Uh, He's asking you, uh, can you play Elvis, His Latest Flame, uh, your book version? Oh, let me look it up. Let's see. I gotta find it. Uh, I got jazz slap. I got ring of fire here. I kind of like ring of fire. That's got some time changes. Uh, bluegrass. I don't know if I entitled it. I saw the light. So I gotta look in here. Ah, oh, here's latest flame. Here it is. Page 37. There it is. Notes. Notes, kids. Learn to read them. They've been reading notes for... All right, here it is. I'm going to play it without the slap. This is the intro. Sing it. That's pretty easy, right? Got the mambo beat. Uh, that's pretty much it. I think he wanted you to slap it. Oh, okay. I think so. so I kind of like using the, the finger G. That's it. So it's a single slap back, 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 and then I go back, da, 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 da. You could do that too. Let's get a picture of a slap. You could put a slap up wherever there's no notes. There you go. Famous flame, page 37. Sounds sounds really cool. <laughs> That's on the, the mambo, the mambo section. Uh, okay, I like, uh, here's I Saw the Light, my favorite song, my favorite gospel song. Let's see. You want to demonstrate that one from the book? Well, I could. Sure. We all want to hear you play. Okay. Here's I saw the light. Jack wrote, <laughs> thanks, Johnny. Superb. It says no slap on this. No slap. Oh, I see. This is from my album. So I did. I didn't slap. I saw the light. I think I've started really slow. Uh yeah, da, 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 I had a violin. Yeah, these are the. This is a, a takedown from my album. So then that, uh, you. I wander so aimless, like Phyllis in. I wouldn't 
let my dear Savior in. A lot of sustain on this page. This came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Then the fiddle goes ding a ding 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 a ding a ding a ding. Then I go. Oh, there. I don't know how to read mails. It took me a while. To, uh, luckily, you can punch in, you know. <laughs> That's how it goes. I did it. I saw the line. I saw the line. And so on. I'm reading my, my own notes here. No more darkness, no more, no more night. I have a mambo slap thrown in. No more darkness, no more night. Bring the Lord, I saw the light. And so on. Woohoo! My fingers are getting. Sounds good. You want to, you know, sit down, leave. Bear stop for a little bit and then continue talking. Then I will ask you to play later on. Okay. Like Whatever you want, George. I'm having a great time. We don't want to put some. Right. Lose Bernie already. <laughs> <laughs> we need a drummer. I know. It. Oh, by the way, uh, get my album. There's there's the CD that has I Saw. Right. Right. I'll sign it to you. There's a bunch of old cars in it. <laughs> yeah, if you guys are interested in Johnny Hatton's album Gospel Bop, go to johnnyhatton.com and yeah. get one. I have one. I actually have two. You gave me two. <laughs> and you can get one of those there too. One of those books too. Yeah. There's, a, there's an online uh, uh, people when, when when they buy a book, they also get an access to some video lessons, right? Yeah, let me show you that. Uh. Yeah, and I I always circle this when I uh, when I sign the book to you. I always circle the like. There's the first page. You open it. There's the second page. A lot of people don't know, so I'll I'll put a little note here and I'll circle. That's a video link. That every book is different, so you have your own personal link. And I think their uh, their their idea is it. I don't think you could bootleg it. You know, because you see a lot of people uh, getting bootlegged online. In fact, I haven't noticed any of, if, of my videos or heard. And when you get to this little icon, see that little arrow? There will be a video of Moa showing you how to do that. These fingers are sore. <laughs> so uh, All our fingers are sore after, you know, eight months of pandemic 10 months of pandemic what, what is it i lost track hey i'm gonna take a walk i want i want you guys to see my my old cars all right all right just make sure that you have a good wi-fi where the cars are uh they're, no they're parked out in front of my house so i'm walking around here we're gonna walk, walk down this hall this outside the house now <laughs> That's where we just came from. <laughs> oh, sunny day. It's always sunny in California. We might have lost John while he was going to show us his cars. I hope he's going to come back in a second. Uh, I doubt that he has a Wi-Fi access uh, where his cars are in front of the house. So I think. Okay. Wife, hey, did you lose me? We lost you. Yes.
Hey, I don't know. I might, can you hear me? I can did hear I, you now. Did you lose me? You, can, you can show us your cars. No. The cars might might be out of range. Oh, I better go back or we're safe. Oh, okay. That's where we're safe and that's where we sound and look good. Yeah. You know, I have good news for you. Uh, Larson just ordered your book and it's going to Sweden. Okay, I think we lost <laughs> Spaz again. Hopefully he's going to come back in a second. Uh, until we see him here. Okay, I think he's back. I'm back. All right, you're back. <laughs> okay, so good news is that Larson ordered uh, your book now and Bless his make heart. sure to ship it to Sweden. That's going to be big postage, man. He paid a lot of money for that book. <laughs> I know because yeah, I'm sure it's worth it. The postage is built in. Thanks, Larson. And Jack wrote, Didi Back and Johnny, your books have been a great help these last couple of years. Oh, great. George, I'm getting the Latin base book for Christmas after your Jenny and the Mexican slap stream. Yes, I really recommend that Latin base book. It's amazing. It's one of my favorite base books. Oh, uh, wow. I think it's dedicated to Cuban base. Are oh. you familiar with that book, Johnny? What? Are you familiar with a Latin base book? No, I'm not. You want it's to? It's excellent book. You know, it's kind of like really good, like for that Cuban, uh, Cuban vibe. Man, I love Latin. It's really cool. I could play tumbaos till the cows come home and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, Med Twins, when we were talking, you when we were talking about you playing with Brian and. Chris at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Mad twins were here and they sent us uh, this photo. Oh, that is. That's so great. Yeah, that's the big. Uh, what? He's showing up with a base. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. That was a great. Uh, is that, uh, uh, that's the base that he he sold, the, 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 the silver base, right? Yeah, he sold that. And uh, oh, they got asked three thousand dollars or maybe thirty five hundred and got it. But uh, that was his base. It wasn't my base. In fact, he asked me uh, on the last tour. He says, "Johnny, is that your base?" I go, "No, it's your base. They made it for you when you did the the first Conan show. But it is a king double base, one of the nicest ones." And, uh, oh, so it's a, it's a king. It's not uh, Blaskolt. Uh, I believe it's king, still king. And then he had an orange king also that they used as a spare. He sold both of those bases. Now, this was all uh, silver sparkle, really outstanding. And, uh, Why did he sell all these instruments? What's that? Oh, here's a big story. Why did Brian so sold all those instruments? Yeah, he sold uh, oh, his, his pages and pages of guitars and stuff. Well, most of them he gets, uh, you know, from uh, Gretsch. They're just given to him. There was a story once the roadie was trying to fix a loose knob on one of his guitars. And they didn't have a tool long enough to reach into the body of the guitar and tighten. Um, so... Uh, he called the Gretsch factor. Hey, can you guys send me a wrench? I need to tighten the the, the knob. And they said, oh, we'll just send you a new guitar. <laughs> there you go. So I think he just tried to thin the herd a little bit. Oh, you see, we, we have, uh, we were talking about the orange uh, bass from Brian. And Nick Presser is the one that got it. Oh, you got it? Where where does Nick live? He lives in Arizona. Oh, nice! That's a good bass. I believe I'm right. That's a real nice sounding bass. Um, I played it. You know, whenever that that was the spare. So if something failed on the bass, 
I'd yell at the roadie, hey, 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 and then they'd bring that bass and plug me in. That's a real uh, nice one. That's this King as well, right? Hello, wife. Not yet. <laughs> she says, Are, am I done? Nope. Oh, sorry. Nick lives in Tulsa. Oh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> He's living on Tulsa time. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. You scored. Uh, yeah. Did they ship it for that price? I'm wondering. Well, he can answer that. But in the meantime, we have Betty here. She said, like, I could listen to these stories all day long. All day. Knowing George's show, it will be all day. Hey, did I tell you the the story of the, the nine words Elvis said to me? Nine words? Who sent you? Elvis. The, the nine oh, no. words. Wait, nine. Five and four is nine. The nine words Elvis said to me. Okay, I'll tell it. I'm not, you're just okay. telling it here. So this is when I was living in Kansas City. And uh, I was, I played mostly bass guitar, but some upper, upright, well, kind of half and half. And uh, because I could read, I was ca uh, called to play in this uh, big band jazz band, like five saxes, four trombones, four trumpets. And we'd get together and, and play it just for fun, you know, to read. And then uh, they also uh, would hire us to back up touring acts. Uh, this is before Alice Cooper, who was the first guy to tour with a massive crew and all the props. Mostly people would just tour with themselves and hire musicians. An example would be uh, the Righteous Brothers came to Kansas City with a piano player. So there's two, two, two guys and a piano player. So they'd pass out the music and we would read the show. Of course, we kind of knew the songs anyway. And then Liza Minnelli, same thing. She came in, so uh, we read her music down. Same thing happened to uh, oh, Clark Terry, the famous trumpet player, uh, played his show. Uh, and so Elvis came into town. And this is in the days when he was uh, at the Hilton in Vegas. And uh, so he, he uh, Joe Gershow was the, the music director. He's a famous writer. I don't know if he's probably passed on now, but uh, we, we, we got to the, the venue and there was a rehearsal before, and then there's a break and they say, wear black pants and a white shirt. We'll give you a vest. So uh, we showed up, black pants, white shirt, and uh, we ran the show, read all the tunes, and uh, they were great charts, all hand copied and uh, well written. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's Joe Gershow, one of the best. And so at the end of the rehearsal, uh, when they, they'd hired a sax section, trump section, trombones, drummer, me, and a bass player, me. So, and it was electric bass. So at the end of the rehearsal, they say, uh, all right, drummer and bass player, you guys are just going to play that 2001 theme and then lay out for the rest of the show. But don't leave the stage. Pretend like you're playing. So I went, oh, because I, I wanted to play. But so it was kind of like, oh. But here's the best part. Uh, I had bought a couple of Elvis albums. At that time, I was a jazz knucklehead. I didn't listen to any Elvis. I didn't listen to any country and Western. I just listened to jazz and maybe some band, the band album, the Brown album is one of the best ever. And things like that, you know. Uh, Mountain was a great album, that band. <clears throat> so anyway, but I thought Elvis was a hick, you know. I'm not going to listen to Elvis records. So I, but I bought two albums. And I took them with me to the gig and a little flare pen. This is pre-Sharpie. They were kind of the similar. And uh, so after the rehearsal, I, uh, we all went to lunch. And I came back. I, put, I got my vest and my pants and shirt. So I'm wandering around with the, with the albums and my flare pen. And so I spied Elvis. He's backstage 
in this long corridor, like where you drive a semi truck in. And he's talking to the colonel. It's just the two of them. Nobody else was around. So I kind of mm. strolled over and I'm standing off about maybe six or eight feet social distancing. And I didn't say anything. I'm just waiting for them to, you know, quit their conversation. Then I was going to say, hey, man, we signed my record. So in the middle of their conversation, uh, like two or three minutes, he, he turns to me and he goes, you want me to sign them for you, Sonny? You want me to sign them for you, Sonny? There you go. It's the <laughs> nine words Elvis said to me. And he signed them. Little tiny, about this big, tiny Elvis. And then I have no idea where they are. Either the babysitter stole them or, or my ex-wife might have them. I could finance my second house with those two albums. That's the story of Elvis. But we did the show and we get on stage. It's the whole auditorium is dark. This is the key, a big auditorium downtown. It's where they have the big horse show every year, the American Royal. Look it up. It's famous. And uh, the place is black as pitch. And all of a sudden, the music starts. I'm piddling. Playing the bass. And the place lights up like the 4th of July. There were so many Instamatic cameras going off. It was like broad daylight. Now, you Midwesterners know that on these days when it's raining, outside it's dark and lightning hits, bam, it lights up for a split second. That's what it looked like. Only it stayed bright like that, that light, uncanny. Elvis wasn't even out of the dressing room, but they're taking pictures. Anyway, that's what I remember about the show. And then I turn around, and there's Ronnie Tut and uh, Jerry Sheff and the whole TCB band behind us. And Ronnie goes, you know, they're in the show. But there he was, Ronnie Tut with his uh, octopads, all of them. It was a big deal then. It was all new. That's the story. Am I still on? Yeah, exactly. Very cool story. So you, you, you basically played Elvis' show, but you haven't played with Elvis. No, no. Just that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. But then he had uh, one of the guitar players. You, the old time guys. They were, one of them didn't have a amp. He just held a guitar and he doubled Elvis's parts. He sang everything in unison with Elvis and wow. had these red scarves, kind of gauzy material, cheap stuff hanging around his neck and he would wipe his brow and hand it to the girls on the front row. And then that guitar player would hand him another scarf <laughs> and the scarves were all in the grand piano. So it was, it was quite a, quite a night. And now there's videos out in 1971. Elvis in uh, Kansas City. They're, they're mostly a compilation of, I think, people who had little, you know, the, the dawn of video cameras. Have you ever spotted yourself on any of those videos? I haven't. I've watched some, and I could never see myself, but I would be sitting down and holding a Fender bass by 61P bass, which got stolen as soon as I moved to L.A., Damn it. I bought that bass from Mel Bay. My dad took me because dad was a oh, wow. like the conductor of the school orchestra. So he would get a lot of material and instruments from Mel Bay Music, which was out in the suburbs of St. Louis. And uh, so, uh, by the way, the Elvis show was in Kansas City. It was a lot later, but dad bought me a brand new P bass, 1961 P from Mel Bay, who said, and I quote, We'll make you a deal where we both lose money. <laughs> well, I was I was at NAM show a few years ago, and I told the guys at the Mel Bay booth, he says, oh, yeah, he's still using that line. <laughs> this is before he passed, but. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> wow. Interesting. 
<laughs> Do you have any idea how many of those books have you sold so far? Uh, yeah, I, I asked the guy. I or I I can order my own. I get them uh, for half price. Woohoo! Come on, give them to me. <laughs> but uh, last time I ordered, I said, "How many have I sold?" And they said, "Oh, eighteen hundred. About eighteen oh, cool. That's not bad. It's not horrible. Yeah, good in these days when nobody buys books. But I I have a new uh book that I'm working on. It's all the I was going to try to have it ready for Christmas, and it's actually I could get you copies. But it's not on the website yet. But I've done takedowns, meaning I've written out every note that I played on uh, "Dig That Crazy Christmas," the uh, what Brian's Christmas album. So all of the notes oh, I cool. you can play along and read along. So even the Nutcracker, the Nutcracker's on there. Oh really? Oh wow! So have you? Uh, are, are there tablature ever on those books, or did no, you write? Or? No. Here's what I say about tablature. Tablature <laughs> is worthless. Forget it. You know, to be I, honest, I never learned. I never learned to figure tablatures. out which fret you're on. You could have played the note if you see it on the page. Sorry, I didn't mean to flip anybody off there. If you were in the way, forget tablature, refuse to play it. Read the notes, folks. Uh, in fact, guess how many tablature sheets I've been handed at a gig? Zero. That's right. You win. Zero. <laughs> that means gig. That means session. That means any music. That means church, like a hymn, playing out of the hymnal. No. And the other worst thing you could do is to have a bunch of lyrics with chord changes over them. No, give us the chart. <laughs> you know, I love like a well-written chart and, you know, oh, unfortunately God. that doesn't happen that this often. Hard to read. In fact, my book starts off this one. It's a, it's really a beginner. It's a book for beginners. Uh, it starts off so simple, man. In fact, the other book I recommend is Samandal. Every bass player should have that. So look, whole notes. That's your first lesson. How hard is that? Bong, two, three, four. Bong, two, three, four. Bong, G, on an open string. The next line, you're playing A. A, two, three, four. How hard is that? The next one, E. There's a, you know, open strings. And then... Next page, you're playing quarter notes. Boom, ch boom, ch boom, rest, boom, slap. You know, it's so simple. And then that's the way they've been doing it for 400 years or more, maybe more than that. Nobody's had tablature. Well, I got to say, I must be honest. There, I've seen tablature for violin, but this is only for Renaissance music where tuning was different. So the you couldn't really read the notes because the tuning was. I learned I, uh, I I learned this from a guy in Europe. So they're real into vintage music, but this was like vintage pre Baroque music, where he 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 tuned to tablature, uh, and that that's how they read the charts. But for bass, nah. Learn the real way. I prefer the real way, and I never learned actually how to read tablatures. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, the classical music and how they were reading something like tablature back in the day. Uh, and I think they also had like something like numbers. So you, you kind of had to know which notes are in a particular um, chord. And then you would be able to uh, improvise on top of that, like in a Baroque, oh, Baroque that's style. Oh, that's your bass. That's called figured bass. We studied it in uh, music, music college. And what it is, you'll have a written note on the page. There is a written note, but above the note, it will say uh, like a three or something. That means play the third above that note. And that just understood that that was a, 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 a one chord. So like a six, four, in other words, if you have a C, uh, or the the sixth note up would be C D E F G uh, A right A and the 
A uh, and the four. So that would be a four chord over a one bass. So that's how that works. It, the numbers tell you the interval above the written note. It's called figured bass. It yeah. was that's the, that was their chord changes. Uh, yes, that was that was very important for especially for. Um, I'm not sure how you say that in English actually. Cembalo, like oh yeah, hard you... chord. The harpsichord, okay. Keyboard instrument. The, the keyboard yes. instrument would be harpsichord or uh, like cembalo or like you say. Oh, okay, I know cembalo, so so that's that's. I'm so glad you translated. Hammered. There's one that plucks the string. The harpsichord plucks the strings, and then there's one that actually touches them with a little piece of metal. It goes bing, you know, and it sounds that note. I forgot what that is. Clavinet. It's a uh -huh. real clavinet, not like your modern ones, the clavinet. I played a clavinet once. They had one at our at our music school. Oh, cool. Larson is asking for his book to be signed since he's oh, going to oh, Sweden. Oh. You know, so <laughs> signed for Sweden, consumer with without, I guess, extra taxes. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Sure. Uh, Mad Twins, I have like a question for you. Johnny, what's your favorite story playing with Setzer? Oh, oh God, let's see. Well, I, I remember my, my first gig was at the uh, uh, Tavern on the Green in Central Park. My first official gig as member. And it was a one-nighter. It was a private party for the people that make the birth control pills. Uh what was it called? Starts with an O. Anyway, they're pharmaceuticals. So uh, we played the party. And then I remember after the show, everybody said, meet in the bar. Meet in the bar. So this was uh, the early band. Now, I've got to say, Brian's been teetotal for probably six years or more. Um, but those days, nobody was teetotal. <laughs> It was a, everybody, the whole band was there and, and Mr. Setzer, God bless him, picked up the tab. And this was kind of a tradition with that band for quite a while as in the early days of touring. And uh, then it tapered off a little bit and uh, Brian became sober and his wife followed suit. And uh, we buy our own booze. <laughs> But we're lightweights, at least I am anyway. I'll have a nice gachi poo at nights, some wine with dinner. But uh, <laughs> so that, that hard I remember. Be I'll try to remember some other great stories. Uh, well, I remember uh, when I first started, when you would come off the stage, the bass was plugged in. Right now I have wireless, uh, which is great, unfettered. You can run all over the place. But for the first few years, I had this giant cord, and it went all the way from my bass clear off stage somewhere. There was, uh, it would go into my amp somehow, and then I would, uh, I'm not sure how this worked. I would have to hit a, hit a kill switch, unplug me myself, and run off, and then uh, the, the guitar tech would plug me into this giant cord that would allow me to go clear across the stage, and... Uh, We'd have to make sure if I crossed Brian's cord, I'd have to uncross the same way I went. So we wouldn't get all, you know, you guys that have worked, I know you, some of you've played chords before and you gotta remember, don't get tangled up in the guitar player's chord. So that was uh, one of the things I had to remember for a while. And then the wireless thing came on, that was great. No cord, except the wireless would, would conk out. <laughs> And then the cord would come. Hey, plug me in. But the roadies were great, man, fast. What would you say, what was the highlight of your career with Brian? Oh, highlight. God, just the whole thing has been a highlight. I mean, every night uh, allowing me to be a knucklehead on stage and do do tricks. And, and uh, that's the audiences, the Japanese audiences. Oh, my God. They're like one body. 
all doing the same thing. You know, if, if we, if Brian goes, hey, everybody goes, hey, back. There's not one guy with his date and the date's going, hey, hey, and he's going, I'm too cool for this. No, they're not too cool for anything. Uh, they, they just great audiences, huge fans. <clears throat> The, uh, Brian took us to a ball. Is Japan your favorite place to play? What's that? Is Japan your favorite place to play? I, I think it's up there. Uh, Jap as far as a country, Japan, excellent food. People are well-mannered, lovely, uh, generous. Uh, the audiences are crazy, crazy good. Uh, the other places, France. The food, the backstage food was like, Going to a fine restaurant, the finest restaurant in L.A., uh, Italy, food, marvelous, wonderful. Uh, but when Brian plays, the audiences are all top-notch, man. Nobody, you know, nobody sits there. They're, you know, they're up against the stage. He likes that, by the way. He hates it if there's people like bouncers going, no, no, stay in your seats. Stay in your seats. Don't get up. Don't block the view. No, he wants people right up on the, like this on the stage. And then if you want an autograph, you better have, you better be on the stage like this, holding up an old sensor album, maybe their first one. And it's likely that he'll, and have a Sharpie, it's likely that he'll sign it. Or if you have a guitar, hold that up with a Sharpie. That's your only way, because... He's out of there. He's in the bus. <laughs> he gets off the stage. He doesn't do like meet and greet usually, right? Say what? He doesn't do meet and greets usually. Uh, oh, uh, they, he does when there's a, a clause in the contract that he has to do one. Ah, okay. Uh, like mostly at a casino. That's where I've seen that. And uh, huh. But he gets paid. He gets a something some remuneration for his time now i'll come out and meet and greet and, uh i'll sell autographs for whatever spare change you have in your pocket at the time <laughs> no i like coming out in front uh, tim messina he's our saxophone player he's one of these crusty new yorkers uh and he goes oh you're going out in front superstar you know, if you, he'll give me that. And I go, well, you, you know, why not? You only get one shot in life. I'm going to go out and say hi to some people, you know, and see what happens. But I'll tell you, if if you do that in Japan, you could get torn limb from limb. So I, I avoid going out. They're, they're just all over you, man. Oh, take him, take my picture. Holy cow, it's like a... Uh, it's all fun and it's all fun. Good memories. I bet. I like to go um, out and see uh, 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 oh, uh, oh, Gretsch guy. God, I'm uh, Joe Carducci. Yeah, go, Joe Carducci usually tours with us and sets up a Gretsch, a Gretsch display in every gig, you know. So I'll go out and hang with, with Joe. and But he's retired now. So. God bless him. So we'll see what next next year going to bring. Um, how many albums have you recorded with Brian? Oh, uh, I think uh, all the Christmas albums, and then Lonely Avenue. Here's a, here's the thing with Lonely Avenue. Uh, I'm trying to think if we've done one after that. He did another Christmas album in. Uh, in Nashville, and I was a little bit late get uh, calling the management because I, I called him and said, listen, man, I want to do the gig. That's my chair. I'll fly myself out there. And they said, oh, sorry, Spaz, we already made arrangements with the producer. He wanted to use session guys. So uh, that gig didn't uh, – they only did, I think, three songs maybe off of the latest album. <clears throat> But uh, uh, yeah, we've done. Uh, I don't know. I would say. Well, my wife says it's like nine, maybe. So nine or ten. 
she counted them once. I remember that. You've been on nine CDs, okay. That's cool. We have like also Mikael here, Finato, who bought the Silver Sparkle. Oh, man. he's a French guy, I understand. I heard it was going to France. We we have all these bass players here in the house. Well, tell here me. in Slapsville. Hey, Michael, that's my DNA all over that bass, all that slimy stuff on the fingerboard. That's from sweat. <laughs> That's cool. And Nick uh, replied to you when you asked him about uh, shipping charge. The shipping charge for Orange Base. They dinged you six hundred and eighty bucks. Hey, I added up all the instruments that were sold on that site. It's something like two hundred eighty thousand dollars. The total. I wonder if he sold those Stratocasters. He had two of them, two blue ones, really old. One of sixty thousand for each one. So far, the, the last I looked, they hadn't sold, but that was two or three weeks ago. Huh? They're probably gone by now. Okay. Do you have any idea on on how many records have you played? Uh, not just with Brian, like all together. I have no idea. I know Big Daddy did did four. The Hodeads did one. I've been on a lot of other people's stuff. Anybody that you would like to mention? Well, uh, I'm on Bernie Dressel's albums, both of them. Bernie? Yeah. All right. Both of them. They're good. Yeah, those are great albums. World, great. That, that band's the world's greatest big band, in my opinion. I have, I have, I never played in a better one. Oh, now, wow. You know, Hey, you should interview Bernie, except he's not a bass player. <laughs> I'm sure he can slap a little. <laughs> well, I, I, I did. When I lived in Kansas City, I produced uh, commercials, like jingles, they call them. So mm -hmm. there, there were a lot of those. Uh, if you're anybody from Chicago, Dominic's Finer Foods back in the, you probably weren't born when I produced it, but Dominic's Finer Foods. That's a big uh, supermarket. I don't know if it still exists. If somebody said, yeah, they're still around. They're like kind of gourmet supermarket. I did Crosstown Lincoln uh, so in Kansas City. There's a store called the Subway. Move on down to the Subway. You got to know just where you're going to. <laughs> Uh, Carolyn just replied, and she said that both uh, Stratocasters are sold. Oh, for, for 50. 50k each. Ah, oh, they came down 10 grand. Wow. Did you buy them, Carolyn? Uh, <laughs> so, the, uh, so you were producing those commercials. So, were you writing those songs as well, or? Right. I would. I I got to be friends with a. A guy uh, who was a trombone player in that kicks in that kicks band, the, that big band, and he was also uh, a, 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 and he worked at an advertising agency. So whenever they needed a, a tune or a jingle, he would. Uh, Bill Bringelson was his name. I still remember. He would say, "Okay," and I would. Uh, he would tell me the client, and he would give me some ideas like, uh, "Of well, governor of Kansas." Vern Miller, integrity, that was their thing. Vern Miller, so I wrote Vern Miller, integrity, you know, a lot of trumpets and stuff. That was just one of them. And uh, so I would go down with my guitar. I just had this old gut string guitar, you know, a classic, classical style guitar. And I was like, well, here's what I think, because I couldn't play piano. So I said, this is what I think. I'd sing it and play it. And he'd go, okay, that sounds okay. And then uh, I'd use guys, you know, in Kansas City, some great players. Man, Kansas City's been a jazz town since the dawn of time. <clears throat> Count Basie played there. Uh, oh, my God. Pat Matheny was from there. I played some gigs with Pat when he was a high school kid, man. He was a big deal when he – came on the scene. He was a clarinet player in, a, in his high school band. He just picked up the guitar and 
I can see why he's so linear because clarinet's a linear instrument. It's not a cluster kind of thing. So yeah, a lot of jazz come out of Kansas City. And so I had a good supply of musicians who could read. And uh, we always went union, filed a union contract because the union was real stout there uh, back in the 70s. It's too bad it's kind of, see, we need more guys with ball bats coming down to the club and breaking up some some glassware and mirrors and things. <laughs> that's, what, that's how they did it in the old days, man. Your union or, you know. So uh, I, I'm getting a pension, my pension already. Pretty pretty handy now in this pandemic now. Only from the union, right. F of M. So, so basically, you were producing and writing music and playing music for those yeah. commercials. Yeah, but I was playing That's six nights a week at jazz clubs. So producing, I started at a at this recording studio just at, at, as I met the guy. I said, "Yeah, we'll give you a job. Come on now." So it was I was putting paper leader between takes of. Uh, they would go to high schools and record their band, set up a couple of mics. All right, the band would play. Then the, so they'd have all these reels of uh, two-track tape, big reels, uh, quarter-inch tape. And it, you'd have to splice. You have to cut out all the stuff between takes and splice in about this much leader tape. That would tell you go like this. One, two, three yards, I think. Three yards of leader tape, and that would give them the, the five seconds between tunes with silence. It would be just paper tape. So that's when I did my first job, splicing tape. Then I started putting mics up and doing this and that. And they were Nashville guys. They were all producing country and western records. So I said, well, I'll play on some of them. So I brought uh, well, my, my not just any of these basses, but I had a real nice bass with a nice growl and a sustain, and I was playing the jazz, and they go, we, we, they, we don't like that bass sound. What do you mean? Yeah, it, it's not punchy enough. You know, so can you try this? So they haul this old clunker of a bass out from behind some sound baffles. It had a hole in the side about like that, and it, it was strung up with guts, real gut string, I'm sure, and it was dead as a doornail. It went boom, boom. No sustain. I, I, I turned up my no. I turned up my jazz nose at that bass, but I get it now. That's the tone I love. Now I want to hear that tone. I want to hear boom, 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 boom. That's a cool story. You know, uh, Dave from um, from Chicago. He wrote Dominic's was sold to Whole Foods and Mariano's. Oh. And he also wrote, thanks for the jingle. Dominic Spider Foods. I forgot the rest of it. And Dominic Spider Foods. Something like that. <laughs> well, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck is asking you any nightmare stories from being on tour or oh, during gigs. God, I love that question. Uh, <laughs> There was one time, well, my first gig with Brian was a trio gig. It was me and Bernie and Brian. And it was, that, was, that was after the one at the Tavern on the Green with the big band. But this is a trio tour. We opened it for Petty. And uh, <clears throat> hot. It was hot summer. And, you know, we'd play the opener, which was still daylight and maybe sun glaring down. And, of course, by the time Petty came all it's all, all cool off. But my hands sweat. They perspire like dripping down the elbow kind of sweat. It's just horrible. That's what's over that, all over that silver base, by the way, that <laughs> the French guy. <laughs> anyway, I was spinning the base. It was uh, the K, which I don't have with me today. I got a 50, 54 K. It's in the shop. And uh, I played that and I'm spinning it and it slips out of my hand and, and it went about two feet and I just lunged for it and grabbed it before it went off the stage. And the roadies are going, har, har. they're cracking up, man. But that was a horror story. I could have lost the base. Um, 
not too much horror swords. Uh, my first gig in Japan, every song was, my ah, fingers are killing me because my chops hadn't, died, hadn't been slapping and put it in the, the beer ice on the way. But horrors, oh, uh, we did witness a, uh, we came up upon a, this is cross, we're crossing Canada in the middle of winter and icy roads, the, the Canadian freeway that goes all the way across the, the country. And there was a, a fatality spin out accident that we had to all slow down and we waited. We were there for hours. I don't, it wasn't a horror story, but it was just something I remember as being rather poignant and sad. Oh, oh let's see. Other horror stories. Hmm. Well, it's just a great gig, I guess. What can I say? Oh, I have one. Here's a good one. Uh, we were going to do an early show in New York as a TV show. I think it was uh, that chick that does a cooking show. I, I can't remember. It was a 3 a.m. bus call, lobby call, 3 a.m. If you're on time, you're late. If you're late, you're on time. Or if you're early, you're on time. Sorry. If you're on time, you're late. If you're early, you're on time. So that's the rule that's been around before us, I'm sure. So I just turned a shower on and the phone rings. Ring. Hey, we're all in the bus. Where are you? Ah! Now, luckily, I wasn't in the shower because I wouldn't have heard the phone ring. And they would have taken off without me. And guess what? If they take off without you, it's called, I learned this term, it's oil spotting. You've been oil spotted, huh? Yeah. Where the bus used to be, now there's an oil spot. And the bus left without you. And you got to get there. It would have been probably a $100 cab ride had I been in the shower and missed that call. Uh, but we made it. I ran down fast as I could, grabbing clothes, putting them on as I'm running, and got to the bus in about three minutes. That was a close call. Wow. That is a nightmare. <laughs> a nightmare story. We had some oil spot I mean, stories in the, in, the, yeah. in the bus, the tour bus. Yes. No, you I'm travel not. with three tour buses, right? There are four. There's a crew bus. Four. Yeah, crew bus, Brian bus, band bus A, band bus B. Now we have the A bus and the B bus. The A bus we call the up with people bus. And the B bus is the F the people bus. <laughs> the B bus. The A bus has the girls. It's got a... Leslie, I call her Toots. Uh, Toots, then the wardrobe lady. So yeah, we're kind of more uh, high class, I would say. The A buzz, the up with people buzz. Robbie Hioki, the non-drinker, trombone player. I heard that Robbie almost got fired once because he didn't drink and party with the rest of the band. <laughs> and Bob Sandman was the leader then, and he says, "I'm not going to fire him." You fire him. So no, he didn't get fired. So, uh, wow. well, we have the, we're in the up with people bus. Now the, the F the people bus, you know, they're hard livers and hard liver. That part too. <laughs> yeah. Now here's who's been in the band for the period of time. If you're smoking weed in the bus, you don't want to be in the back room with a window open because what happens the the bus the front of the bus is a vacuum because the air is coming around the windows and creating a vacuum that actually wants to suck air out of the bus right out of any little crack so if you're smoking in the back of the bus the smoke comes all the way to the front of the bus towards the vacuum not I don't smoke anymore I used to but there are guys we the F the people bus. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So who's been in the band for the longest period of time? Who? What? Who, who as far as BSO, who's been in a band for the longest period of time? Okay, the, the old timers are, 
are Tim Messina. He was there from the beginning. Saxophone, oh. he's a leader. Uh, Robbie Hioki, trombone player, oriental looking guy with a uh, uh, kind of, he's got gray in hair now. And Jim Youngstrom, another sax player. Uh, and Julie, Julie Setzer. All of those that were in the band before me. The rest of the guys are all new or have joined the band since I did. So I'm old guard now. <laughs> you know, like it's been a while since we heard you play something. Do you mind to oh, okay. choose one of those girls <laughs> behind you and play something for us? Any request? Let's see. Uh, I think it's, it, I think it's your call. All right. I have the I have rock around the clock in my book. The cool. actual part that Marshall Lytle played. So I will play that for you in the Marshall Lytle style. Please do. <clears throat> now the the odd thing about rock around the clock is it's in a high register it's not low notes so i'm going to show it the fingers what's mm -hmm. <clears throat> one for the money two one two vinegar. let's see is that right yeah well but, uh, those are different lyrics you're singing blue set too right away it goes but uh there's drum but up up and he hit two, say one, two, three, two, three, four, one, two, three, go to rock, rock, around new clock. Uh, I'm sorry. There's that little slap before the first note that's very cool. Rock around the clock tonight. Ba -dang. And you hear that little click that Marshall does. It's just beautiful. repeat so does it the same way That's the best bass line ever. Just the, okay, well, I'll, I'll start where I left off. The sax solo. <laughs> you missed it all there. Here's the vocal. That's the that's rock around the cop. Now the interesting thing here is you can play this whole thing in this position. Uh, you can, for the D you'll have to go. You can play the whole song in uh, whatever position that is, right about there. The whole song. Last note's an open A. That's the lowest note. That what, note. what gives the 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 song um, that cool drive? And 
we, we've been talking about your book and about uh, your approach to slap base. And I want to ask you something about the terminology that you're using. So what would be, but don't leave your base. Oh. <laughs> I need you to show me something on your base. Uh, so um, can you show me what would be a single slap for you? What would be a double slap? What would be a triple slap? Yeah, the single slap is just what I did. Let's point this down at my slap hand. Oh, let's back up. So single slap. You can bring your hand way out. Double slap. Or, or a triple slap, same as double slap, except instead of, uh, well, bluegrass or a hillbilly slap. That's a quarter note, two eighths notes. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So uh, you can do that as a triple slap. The heel slap, bang, gong, heel, tips. For a real slap. Mambo. There's a lot of the mambo slaps in here, too. So variations on one. The basic is like... A lot of mambo songs in the 50s. New Orleans music, too. So, but mambo slap. You can add to that. So, uh, that's in the book. You can put a little diddly in there. That's kind of a fast heel slap. Heel slap, I don't know if you can see it. Bounce the heel, bounce the heel, and it hits the tip. Bum, 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 bum. All right. Heel tip, heel tip, heel tip. By the way, you, everybody's got to send me 60 bucks for this lesson, okay? I'll give you the address later. the show. And, and, you know, you could do this. It's just... But why not make it look fat? Well, this just looks great. You know, you could do some antics. All right. I have a couple questions. First question. Um, so if single slap is the one where you have, you pull in a string yeah. and, um, and then you're slapping the fingerboard, that's what you call single slap? Yep. That's what I call And it. how would you call when you just pull the string and the string that's slaps snap. the fingerboard, but you don't have a palm slap? Yeah, I call that the snap. And the, and the fact that that's lesson one is the snap. That's when you pull it. That's your first lesson. Hold on. G, G, D, all open strings. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So when you play like that, you want to say that you're slapping the bass? Yeah, the slap is when you hit it. Yeah. So you snap. Okay. Slap. When you're using that technique that you're, you they say when they, you say snap, so when you play that, you wouldn't say that you're actually slapping the bass. No, because you're you're pulling the string and letting it go. That's, okay, so that's snapping the bass. Huh? That you would consider that snapping the bass, not slapping. That's what I call it, just for lack of a ter better term, you know. Or you can okay. call 
picking or pizzicato if you like. But pizzicato, I'll usually think of this. But whereas this is different because it's got to hit the fingerboard. Sure. Yeah. Whereas pizzicato. That doesn't hit the finger board. So you're basically counting, uh, counting the slaps of the basically palm slaps. Yeah, there's a so yeah. Most of the stuff is just fingers, you know, the flat fingers. The tips need to come back to the string where you're going to be picking. So, for example, if you slap the A string. But the next note is a D string. You want to be there. So see, I slap the D, so my tips are ready to go on the D. Now they're ready to go on the A. Here's the exercise. Go from G to E. You can't go palm and then run over. you got to hit the string you're going to be playing. On when I do when I do lessons as well. Um, so m my other question, as far as terminology goes, uh, so double slap is something which you also call uh, a hillbilly slap. You call that a double slap? Well, a uh, double slap could be just slapping it twice. So doesn't have to be heel. Okay. And what is the reason for a triple slap? Slap is also slapping it twice, right? What's, he, what's that? For triple slap, you're also slapping it twice. Why are you calling it triple then? I don't think I have a triple slap. I, I think, uh, I mean, I guess you. Oh, okay, so that would be a triple slap. You got it. One, two, three, two, three, four. There's three slaps. Okay. You could. Sure, sure. I use. I usually call that quadruple. I I, I, I count the slap of the string and the slap of the palm. So all together, that that made more sense for me. Yeah, this. But is you know, I, I'm interested like, to hear different people's approaches. Yeah, I, I like to de delineate between this which i call the snap because you're snapping the string like a rubber band like you can snap it against you know sure whereas this is a slap okay now, another question uh guys in the one that i heard that someone is calling that um figure a mumbo slap the one where you have two dotted quarter notes and one quarter note that you call usually people call that rumba what is the reason hey, mambo? Maybe that is a rumba, but I don't know. I just, uh, uh, well, I call it mambo only because New Orleans, I played in a New Orleans band and they said that's Mar Mardi Gras mambo, 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 Mardi Gras mambo, 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 Mardi Gras mambo, down in New Orleans. That that's the mom that I associate that beat. With. Ah, okay. So All right. you associate with the song. Yeah, I see what you song. just did, I would, I would associate with the second line. Yeah, see the Mardi Gras guys. Uh, they weren't really uh, Latins, you know, just a lot of black musicians. But so they they called it the mambo, I guess. Yeah, just be, uh, that's what I. That's the reason why I call it the mambo. Sure. Yeah. I love that pattern, you know, especially when you hear like old school guys doing it. Yeah. Uh, Nick asked, you know, asked Nick, I would do this, but I don't have my bass with me. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not in Los Angeles. So maybe next time I'll be able to do that. But if you watched like a previous episode, you, you know, my approach. Um, who would you say was the biggest influence on your bass playing? Oh, Ray Brown. <laughs> Ray Brown? Okay. Because when I started playing bass, it was jazz, you know, Ray Brown. And uh, I had an album. It was called 
it was Oscar Peterson, and it was called. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask. Was it Oscar Peterson trio? Yeah, it was the Oscar Peterson trio. Ray Brown on bass, and I thought this guy's so melodic. You know, I just love it the way he was so cool. his notes, how melodic they were. Yeah, Ray Brown, and then, uh, well, of course, I love Marshall Lytle's tone on rock, rock around the clock. Uh, Georgie, you inspire me. I can't slap that fast to save my soul, you know. <laughs> uh, Jocko Pastorius. Oh, really? Okay, interesting. Yeah. I learned how to play Donna Lee. I think every every bass player I know learned learned his version of Donna Lee on the electric bass. It was so crazy, like when he played that it's song like, and that tempo. I read his biography. It's real pre depressing, man. He no. he had he took himself down, man. Yeah, um, Robert Trujillo did a movie about him. Uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, oh, you should check him. You should check out the movie. Yeah, I have to watch that. One of um, our, one of the guys in the Hodads, that rock band I play with, is from Florida, and he he played. Uh, he said he played some gigs with with them when he was just a young high school kid. Wow, that's so cool. We all start in high school somewhere. Playing. Yeah, that's so crazy. Um, what would you say? How did you develop your your style of playing? Oh well, I took tons of violin. down besides that. What's that? Besides uh, listening to Ray Brown, I just uh, looked at people playing this. Like Jason Burns showed me stuff when I first was slapping, and uh, that's how I like. But basically, I, I just. Everybody's influenced me. Ray Brown, like I say, choice of notes. Uh, Jocko, amazing uh, player of all, you know, amazing calisthenics on the electric bass. It's just so many people, uh, bands throughout the years. I remember one of my favorite bands was just bass and sax. This guy in Kansas City says, yeah, well, just this former band, just bass. Yeah, just brace and sax, you and me. And he's all hype. And so he said, all right, now we'll play the blues. But after the 12 bars, anything goes. Just just keep counting 12 bars. So it'd be <laughs> we were taking it way out. And I'll never forget it, man. I get, I get goosebumps thinking about that. Just bass and sax. And I've had other people say, oh, yeah, that's the best combo. Bass and sax only. I and like that, that sound. Two lines. You don't have to worry about chords or anything or a piano player getting in the way. <clears throat> I think that Mingus did some duo recordings with Eric Dolphy on sax. That's possible. You know, that, that saxophone and that bass, you know, always sounded really cool for me together. Um, and he played some slap as well. He did some slap in a Jelly Roll Soul song. You know, um, you, you look at all those old old movies and they're, they're 40s movies, like with Bing Crosby and shit. And you see the bass player going like this. I got to show. I can see that. Can you see my hands? They're, they're picking it like this. Not going like this. That's the, that's the modern. Because you got an amp, you know, but they didn't have it. They had it. And, and if you if you pick it hard enough, it becomes a slap. So uh, yeah, those old forty. We were watching some Christmas, like uh, Ben Crosby, I think it was. And we see the bass player going bam, bam. <clears throat> and they oh, didn't. I have a question now. Like you said, like if you pick it up hard enough, it becomes a slap. Yep. Uh, why did you call it slap now and not snap? Well, I don't know. It just. Uh, <laughs> You're busting my balls, Georgie. <laughs> uh, the the uh, the baton of the it goes way back. Some one of my students brought in some twenties records, real you know the 
real bad sound. And you could hear the, the bass snapping, snapping. And I think it just, they had to do that or else nobody could hear them. They had to just dig it. I remember playing my first the recording where you can actually hear bass is uh, Ed Garland with Kid Ori. It was recently remastered. I believe it, for, it was from 1922 or 23. All right. And you can hear bass, but it's not very audible. And then uh, next one where you can hear slap, uh, it's with Harry Barth. And right after that is is uh, is uh, Steve Brown slapping with Gene Colgate Orchestra. The best song is probably Dinah. Right. That's, really cool. That's all 90, 1926, 25, 26. And after that in 20s, you have some really cool, even Duke Ellington. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, with his Cotton Club or a band, like he had uh, the, um, he had, you know, slap bass all the time. Um, what would you say were the most uh, for for yourself the uh, the the most essential slap bass recordings? Bass recordings, slap bass uh, recordings, the most essential. Well, like I say, that Night Train album with uh, Oscar Peterson was awesome. Uh, I just learned a lot from that album. Um, You know, I hear things. I listen to the radio a lot. I don't. I, I, my record player is not working right now. <laughs> I think I need a new uh, stylus. But uh, that's a good, really good question. Uh, I just think I just play what I hear most of the time. <laughs> um, and it sounds great. Yeah. Well, so you inspired me, Georgie. The most important. All your calisthenics on the bass. Yeah, you inspired me. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I learned um, some Jason. As far as uh, nowadays uh, slap bass players, who would you choose? Who do you like to hear? Me. <laughs> I love like, like to hear you play. Well, I, I, I haven't heard anybody that can outdo you, Georgie. So, yeah, I think you're the cat. All right, thank you. All right, but besides me, is there anybody else that you like as far as slab bass players? I can't think of any. Um, I know I hear things, so I go, what are who that is? You know, I don't know who it is, but I hear it, and I go, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, there are some cool cats out there. Um, I, I just one, one interesting question that I like love asking, you know, especially people that played in different uh, uh, music genres, is how did your band leaders react when you play uh, slap? Was there anyone that told you, "Hey, don't do that," you know, "this is too much slap," or like, yeah. "or oh, play slap all the time," stuff like that? Somebody did tell me, "Don't slap." I can't remember who it was. That's something. But I did have that happen. Only once. I can't remember the situation. Uh, I've had drummers and, uh, I've had drummers tell me uh, that they didn't like the fact that we're going, you know. And then a fact that reminds me of a story. Um, I did this show while well, Bernie was on it. It was a tribute to Sun Records, we, we took it to Montreux. There was a, uh, a producer in town named Philippe Raoul, French guy, and he put the show together. And uh, we did all Sun Records stuff. We backed up Billy Lee Riley and Sonny Burgess and uh, let's say Albert King, maybe. There was a third act and Brian May. So they're all Sun, well, for some reason, I don't know why Brian May was there, but maybe he just likes Sun Records. But uh, anyway, Billy Lee comes up to me. He says, uh, you know, you modern bass players, you slap all the time. He says, when we were st just starting out, we only slapped unless there was no drummer. So that was a kind of an interesting effect. Billy Lee. Huh. 
So the yeah, if there was a drummer, you just played regular time. Interesting. I never heard that story. And I never played with Billy Lee Riley, but I did play with Sonny Burgess, and that was a wonderful experience. And it was with, in Memphis with DJ Fontana on drums from oh, Ellis Presley's band. Yeah, Billy Lee yeah, passed really away a few years ago. Oh, excuse me? Uh, Billy Lee died a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. I know. DJ as well. Uh, Larson is asking you, what, uh, when was the first time you started slapping? I believe you answered that with the Big yeah. Daddy, right? A band with Big Daddy. Um, it was with Big another Daddy. question that I wanted to ask you uh, is, what would be your advice for a younger uh, generation, how they can get a gig? You know, for a slap bass player, it's there's really just few gigs, you know, on the planet, like a big one. Hey, let and, me know how to get a gig, okay? You tell me. Uh, well, from my personal point of view, learn how to play every style, learn how to read. Don't just be a slap bass player. I mean, if I played slap bass, that would only slap bass, that would cut me out of the symphony gig. That would cut me out of the big band gigs where I, they don't want that. They just want you to read and play good time. So, you know, you can't go to a, a, a movie session, for example, and do a movie score uh, on slap bass. Uh, I had to take the bass with the C extension, and I had to bow. It was all bowing. So slap when you need to, and then the rest of the gigs, play what the gig calls for. If it's pizzicato, just go pits. If it's arco, play arco. But learn it all. I would get the Samandel book, uh, learn Arco, try to get in a symphony. They love bass players. You know, they're like, any. we can't get enough bass players. We're short of them. So, uh, yeah, play every style you can think of. I agree with you. I think that's very important. And I think that's something that, you know, people often neglect in, right. in their uh, – learning process the they thing usually focus on the style that they like the most yeah and you're you're gonna um, uh, several bases you 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 wouldn't want to necessarily slap your symphony bass because it does tear up the fingerboards i had to get a new fingerboard on that german bass <laughs> and uh, um, if you if you could give an advice to young uh, John Hatton, or like, if you can, I mean, if you can, could give an advice to young, you know, yourself, uh, like, what would be something, which mistakes would you point out and say, like, hey, don't do that and do this instead or something like that? Well, you know what, the, 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 the Hollywood model is show up, shut up, and play your ass off. <laughs> And uh, I never heard that. You're on time. You're late. Be early. Uh, my problem is I don't shut up. I think that's <laughs> lost me. Lost me work. <laughs> you lost some gigs because because we did. You know. Of <laughs> yeah. Keep just show up, shut up, and play your ass off. That's the that's the three, the three bot. That's the three suggestions I, I've been hearing forever. You know, I never heard about it, but you know, now it's engraved in my brain. <laughs> um, what would be something that you could recommend, like for our fellow bass players to practice on a daily basis? <clears throat> well, it depends on what you're playing. Like if you're if you're only doing slap gigs, just you know, do a little slapping every day to keep your your callus is built up. Mine are gone because <laughs> I've been doing carpentry work since the pandemic hit. So, uh, yeah, my fingers are a little sore just from the slapping I did here today. A little bit of slapping today. A little yep. bit of slapping on the slap stream. <clears throat> but it's interesting, you know, almost all my guests, you know, told me that, you know, I haven't been slapping, you haven't been playing, you know, since the pandemic. You know, I'm out of shape. You know, we're all out of shape. But, you know, that's why I created the slap stream so we can still see that we're all in this together. All yeah. the slappers. 
play electric bass, learn how to play that. I have a fretless electrics. Uh, so they all come in handy every now and then. You Most have several electric bass players, right? You have a Gretsch too, right? Yeah, I got a really nice Gretsch. Thank you, Joe Carducci, the White Falcon. It looks amazing. And uh, I have uh, Joe Carducci also got me a, a, a Fender Jazz bass. It sounds great at sessions. And uh, I have a Music Man bass that I, I bought a long time ago. I have one of the original Music Men uh, somewhere. And a fretless P bass, four string. Uh, I have a another bass by, uh, i trying to think of the brand name. Uh, well, they're everywhere. <laughs> the wife is going to clean oh. up someday. But I go, they're all going out in the dumpster, I think. No. <laughs> um, how do you warm up before the gig? Oh, man, sometimes I don't. Most times I don't. Just start playing. I'll tune up. Here's how. Here's warm up. Let's see. Plug it in. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. Adjust this knob a little bit. Okay, maybe I got to adjust this. This is in tune. Okay, tune it. All right, let's go get a drink. That's my warm up. That's a good warm up. Um, <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned that you never have problems with feedback when you play Jason's basses. Um, how do you find feedback on your other basses, like Bertha? Uh, well, I, first of all, I don't play Bertha loud very much. And then I'd say, well, and then there's, in Bernie Dressel's band, I was playing Bertha, but I had, uh, I go through the house. I could give the house guy a line out of my, my amp. So we have those speakers out in front that are, going to be given in the bass so keep the volume low on stage also if the body if the bass is here put the amp over here and try to keep it the speakers on the same plane as your bass so that they're shooting out you never want to put the speaker behind your bass because it'll howl like a banshee and then uh I think use small speakers uh, in small clubs, uh, like a 212s, for example, and just plug into the house. And you can say, can you give me some monitor up here if you want to hear more of yourself? And, uh, and then, the, but the, uh, for Brian, <clears throat> the, the speakers are, are over to my left. And, uh, and then I'm playing a bass that has tons of metal flake and paint, which deadens them down. So get the worst sounding bass you have and make that your rockabilly bass. Because the worse they sound, the less they're going to feed back. Because you're mainly going to be hearing the pickup. You're not going to hear the bass past the sax section. <laughs> <laughs> you won't hear the click past the sax section. So, yeah, get in the PA. Do you have any um, any any tricks like when you when you record bass? How do you like to record your bass? Oh, uh, I like uh, a mic for oh when I when we recorded uh, Brian's uh, I forgot which album one maybe one of the the last one that Bernie was on I remember they came in and they said oh you got Sinatra's mic <laughs> it was a capital. So it was it was set down here by the just by the bridge. He had a mic. He had two down there. One was a big RCA, and then the other was a. Here I'll tilt this a wee bit so we can see the the bridge. There was a mic here. The big RCA was that one. The the Sinatra's mic, and then there. I mean the big. I don't know, UM57 maybe. And then there's that big RCA. It's all angular. It was over here. So they had two mics right about here. That's getting the low end. And then they put one up here just for 
just for the click sound. And then I was going direct as well. Uh, I went direct with the uh, the King double bass uh, amp, you know, so they could get some click in that. So they were, I think I had something like uh, four channels of bass. Anyway, it sounded great. But often some of the smaller studios, just one mic placed, uh, you know, it's all about where you place it. And uh, if you get it too close to the FOs, you're going to get nothing but woof. So you need it up a little bit. Do you have a, a, a system? How do you develop your bass lines? Nah. Well, I, I, I say the in the mood lick. You can't go wrong with it. Like this. There you go. Hell, that'll get you through a lot of, lot of, lot of gigs. Sure, but so, you, so are you thinking about the chords, or you're thinking, thinking about scales, or you're trying to make a counterpoint? Well, I think if you play your first, it, whenever the chord changes, you want to be there on the root, your first note, and then the next most important note is the third because that'll tell you if it's major or minor. And a lot of people listen to the bass. What chord is that? Because they can't hear the guitar. Bass is lower frequency. It tends to, elephants can hear it like miles away. And so uh, I tell my bass students, it's your duty to let everybody know what chord change it is, because likely they're not gonna hear the guitar or the piano. They'll hear the bass. So you wanna give them like on the mambo beat. There's your triad right there. Root, third, fifth. That tells you right now it's a major chord. If you want a minor, flat the third. They do. Okay, it's a, it's a B flat minor. Here's a B flat major. So the most important note, two notes, is the root. And the third, that tells you major, minor. And you don't have to know about flat, uh, the, the flat, uh, sharp nine or all that. That's for the guitar player to figure out. Your duty is lay that triad. Root, third, fifth, third. There, it's good to try it. And you can connect them all together. So, so there was a B flat chord walking up to an E flat. Four chord. Walk down to the one. Walk down to the five. Walk down to the... So you connect them all. You can, they know where you're going. There's all millions of ways to to connect all the chords up, yeah. Uh, and when you write music, um, how, I mean, how often do you write music, your own music? Um, I, I write when I need to, but uh, uh, I, it usually when I'm writing, it's like a chord chart for the church band, <laughs> oh, okay. something like that. But I did write arrangements. I've did done some producing, so uh, I just write what you, you know what? I took music, I took a 20th century music writing class in, in uh, when I was in university years ago. And uh, we learned all about modern harmonies and thing. And I, and I, we had a writing assignment. I says, Herb, Herb Six was the, the teacher. And I go, Herb, how do I know what to write? And he says, write what you hear. That stuck with me. You write what you hear. You think Tchaikovsky's writing what he heard. Uh, I like that advice. Leonard Bernstein, the, one of the best scores ever is, uh, is West Side Story. It's based on the flat fifth 
and uh, and the Latin beats. I think it's yeah, it's either Latin or yeah, but the, everything. Ari, Maria. There's a flat five. The devil's interval. It ends on that very last note of this song or the movie is because oh, it's a dark comedy, dark musical. That I just met a girl with a name. Yeah. Yeah, listen to that score. Mind blown. We have like a, a couple of comments, you know, Fernando. He Sam. wrote, Hi, John. We met in Santa Monica Airport after marrying my wife in Las Vegas. And it was ah. a great night. You left me slapping your bass. Hey, yeah, yeah. 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 I, we bought him and his old lady a really expensive dinner at a local restaurant too. <laughs> you owe us, man. <laughs> we went to Fernando the is great. Fernando was actually doing uh, some graphics for the slap stream. No, great guy. No. I met him in, in Barcelona. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Barcelona. No, Buenos Aires. He's now in, in Spain. Oh but yeah. He was in, in Argentina. Well, well, by golly, let's get together, man. So, uh, yeah, we ate at Typhoon. Typhoon, by the way, is closed. They, they tripled their rent. The guy says, fuck you. I can't stay in business. That restaurant had been in business for, I don't know, years. You, play for, you were playing with Bernie? Uh, uh, Bernie did play a gig at the Typhoon, yes. In fact, we... Oh, okay. I think I saw you guys play over there. We played the Thursday before they closed. And oh, then okay. The other restaurant that closed, we played the Thursday before they closed the, what was it? Uh, that one in uh, Cafe Cordial around the mm -hmm. same time. We were close okay, restaurants man. all over the place. Absolutely. All right, so I have a couple more questions for you. We've been talking for over three hours, man. I know, and I got to go pee. <laughs> hey, all I, right, got, I, I got to show them on my t-shirt or my sweatshirt my son bought me this birthday boy get it Ta -ta. peace peace whose birthday is it uh, that's a that's a trick question it's jesus <laughs> it's the birthday boy yep uh, Paul, uh, Swash Buck, Buckler Paul, he said, I want to thank you for the quick lesson at the NAM show in 05. Oh, yeah. Too bad. I miss NAM. Oh, Too yeah. Bad. We all do. 15 years ago. I think that okay. you're the only person that, I, not the only one, but one of few people that I see every year at the NAM. Yeah. If I don't see you through the year, I know that I'm going to see you in January. This I know. Week. Uh, they had a couple of bases at the at the King a uh, Blast Cult booth a couple of years ago. Man, uh, we had a bass duo with uh, I forgot his the uh, name with a kind of long haired. Anyway, he and I he's a great player too, man. Um, what kind of strings are you using? Well, these are uh, Innovation Golden Slaps. I like those because they're. They're synthetic gut, and uh, they last forever. They're wrapped A, wrapped E. I, I don't like unwrapped gut for the low end. I think you got to have wrapped. got to have wrapped A and E. That's just me. And uh, that's for all my uh, vintage bases. Uh, they slap well. They're easy on the fingers. Um the only steel strings I got are on Berta. Berta. Uh, once my chops are built up, I but see how they're they're kind of tinny and you know when you slap them. But they record this thing records great, especially if I use a shadow. What strings are those? What's that? What are those strings? You know what? 
I think they're, I don't know, they're not uh, spiracores. Spiracore, I, I didn't think they sustained that well. I'm not sure what these are. I think uh, they might be labellas. Well, here, here's the colors on the strings. There's green and there's green and red. So green and red wrapping. So if we can figure out what that is. Okay. They are. I haven't played those. I'm not sure. I play spiral chords. I play chromastics. Yeah, I'm not sure what those, those are neither. Huh. But I don't slap this bass too much. It's mostly jazz. Yeah, all the rest are, are innovations. And how often do you have to change your, your strings? When they break. <laughs> when they break, how often does that happen? Uh, very rarely. Like I say, look at this red bass. The, the copper, the, the metal strings are worn down to the copper. Look at that. That's spare copper there. There's no silver at all. Let's see if I can hold. They're still still working. Why should I change them? I mean, I'm going through an amp. I get the sound I like. They're dead. By that that this neck needs planing a little bit. They're punchy. Here's something that'll wow your rockabilly fans when you start the little little thumb position. They go, "What? Wow, how do you do that?" You know. <laughs> They'll go, "What?" <laughs> thumb position. It hurts. I love your thumb position. You know, it's. You can re always hear the melodies and intonation much better than in lower registers. Yeah, it hurts. It hurts uh, thumb right there. Ow! <laughs> you get a big knob. As far as amps, what is your preference for the am amplification? Well, uh, I've been endorsed by DNA, which is David Nordskow. Uh, he's the guy who invented the. SWR and the Eden amps, big, wonderful bass amps. So I've been using the Eden World Tour 2000 for a long time with Brian Setzer. They love that. They love it. They got it dialed in. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, he sold Eden to St. Louis Music. So he came up with a new line. Well, a SWR. You know, Fender just squashed that. They bought it and then squashed it. It doesn't exist anymore. But they were good amps, too. Um, in fact, we had SWRs on the Rockabilly Riot. They weren't enough. The 410s weren't enough to handle the load. But, you know, in the house, it sounds okay. You never hear the stage uh, in the house. You hear the PA. So that's what's important. But, um, yeah, SWR is, is now gone. If you can get an old redhead, those are great amps. Um, so, but David Nordskow has a new line called DNA, which is his real name, David Nordskow uh, Amplification. And he's not David Eden, <laughs> uh, but he is David, same guy. But he, I don't know where, where the Eden came in, but he's doing some good work. Big, I have two. Uh, I have two 410 cabinets for the tour at, that I use with Brian. So I'm, I have eight tens on stage. It's just really great. <laughs> you can hear yourself good. Um, and then I use, uh, he, he built me a 212 cabinet and, or sorry, I think it's a 112 cabinet and then there's a 210 cabinet that I have that are smaller, I take to smaller gigs. I've used that with Bernie a couple of times and different, you know, they're smaller, they're heavy though, 
I got to say, they are heavy. <clears throat> anyway, I recommend those. I know, but there, there's a lot of guys pl playing, uh, oh, God, um, GK. I think I would go yeah, GK. I'll play GK on this scene. Yeah. I might. I play orange. I play orange. Deal. GK guys, if you're out there. So, so with Brian, you uh, you use eight ten uh, Eden or DNA. The DNA cabinets, but they're uh, same guy made them, and I use the Eden amp. So, oh, it's, okay. it's still David e Nord Scout, David Nord Scout stuff. Got it. And you mentioned that uh, your signal goes directly to PA, not to, not through your amp. Well, I go through behind me. I have this rack, and there's the there's several amps in there. I even have one of uh, the, the the new DNA amp, but it was making a weird squeak. It was going ee, real high squeaky something going on. So they they went back to using the Eden. Uh, World Tour 2000, which is a monster amp. I, uh, when I travel, a lot of times, like I was with Jose Feliciano traveling, a lot of venues had the uh, the World Tour amp, Eden, the whole thing. They sound great. Um, but on set on the on Brian's thing, I do plug into the the rack, and it powers the eight tins behind me, and then they go out of the the head to the house, but they also mic the the speakers because th there's a difference, man. Sometimes the speaker tone is it, so they'll put a mic, just one mic on one of the speakers on the eight tens, and then the rest is direct. And I have wireless uh, pickup. I have wireless pickup, so I don't know if you notice the Velcro down here. Right next to the tailpiece, I have two wireless uh, pickups, and they go, uh, you know, I said I plugged into the Eden. Well, I do, but it's wireless. It goes wireless into the receivers, which are mounted in the rack. They have little antennae. And uh, so, yeah, I'm wireless. It's really fun. There's two two wireless, one for the click, one for the, the fundamental Lately, they've been using just one. I think they're getting lazy, but they, you know, it almost doesn't matter. It's rockabilly. It's rock and roll. As long as it's grooving hard. Uh, and people, I ask everybody when I go out in front, hey, how'd the bass sound? Oh, it sounded great. Okay, that's all that matters. It's not about you anyway. You know, I'd like to maybe hear a little more click in the house, but it's not my gig. It rocks regardless. That's the attitude you got to take, man. Show Absolutely. up. Absolutely. That's rock roll. Play your ass off. And as far as pickups, do you always use those shadow pickups? You know, the 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 guys in sets, or I tried to get them to use a shadow, but but they were all real busy setting up, and they didn't want to deal with it, you know, and because they – they complained about this. They, they tried to plug them into the way they had dialed in the board already. And it just sounded weird. They didn't want to mess with They were too busy to miss. So I just let well enough be alone. And I, I use, I just stuck with the, the wire, wireless. Uh, well, we were using, uh, I think we're using Sure now. We used, uh, oh, God, who was the other wireless people? I forgot. Anyway, we're still we're just wireless now. One channel, EQ'd. Oh, okay. So, so which pickup are you using? They probably, I would imagine, they're using the the one uh, that's probably the bridge pickup. I'm sure it's the bridge pickup, and not the click pickup. That's what okay. I get. This sounds okay. Sure, but it, but it's shadow pickup. No, I'm going straight wireless into the World Tour 2000. 
Okay, but it's, it's which pickup is it? Is it Underwood or? Uh, it, it it's. I would say yeah. It's. I guess it would be the Shadow pickup. Oh, okay. Right, but they're just taking it direct. Uh, I don't know. This is not the base I use the rev. I, I had to go over and look at the brown base for. Actually, I've been. I was using the silver base. They sold it. Got to ask that French guy, man. <laughs> uh, it might be one of the old uh, King Double Base pickups too, on there. Ah, okay. Yeah. So since we're talking about uh, bases, do, when you tour, do you always play and bring your own base, or sometimes you rely on on a uh, backline? Uh, I, when I was, my first gig, I was playing this bass. Jason built this bass for me right after I joined, uh, the BSO. Cause, uh, and so this is, this bass, the red one's been around a lot. And then, um, uh, one time, well, when we did the riot, rockabilly riot with the three bases, Brian wanted the brown bass. He wanted, uh, Dale, the Western looking one. Uh, so. And then they, I was using this for BSO, but it, they got Christmassy. They wanted something. That's when the silver base came on deck because it looks more Christmassy, I think. So I'm not sure what I'm going to be playing on the next. Well, if Jason, he's got to get my base finished, the green one. That's, that's what it is for 2021. So if not, I'll be playing the red bass again. It's kind of red, you know, maybe put some tinsel on it. It's a cool bass. All right, so I have one more question for you. No. And, and I'll ask you, you know, to play something, and then, you know, we're going to be finishing this close to four hours. <laughs> but before I do that, I want to ask you, if, is there anything that you would like to uh, mention that we – you know that I haven't asked you. Is there anything that you would like to say that I, you know, if I missed from your long and successful career? Ha. Ooh. Well, uh, for me, all music is good music and worth worth playing. You know, whether well, not all the music. I can't go for techno so much. I mean, it is music, but it puts real musicians out of work so and there's no not that much feeling when it's just a computer uh the, the best feeling is when you got guys on stage they're all you know you know what it is guys when you're on stage playing together you feed off each other and uh that's to me is the best music i love 40s i love sinatra i love dean martin i love the bounce of those old bass sounds uh, <clears throat> I love Bach. I could, I could, if I was on a desert island, I would want to, I would want the, uh, Brandon, uh, the, uh, Goldberg variations. If I had one CD, I'd want the Goldberg variations because they're never ending source of amazement. Each, 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 each movement, uh, Wagner, what a master of the triads, and just hair hair raising. Listen to the Nutcracker Suite in full, Tchaikovsky, and listen to that. <clears throat> How he puts those notes together, and the flutes. He's a master of writing for the flutes. It's all music. Don't turn your nose up at highbrow. Yeah, in fact, go listen to the Nutcracker now. The whole thing, not Brian's version. Well, yeah, that too. That's a great version of. It. In fact, I did a, a a bass a takedown of my bass part on the Nutcracker that Brian recorded, which, by the way, will be available on JohnnyHatton.com along with some other stuff. So you can read the parts that we played that I played, and. Uh, Let's see. Am I supposed to play something for you now? Oh, uh, well, anyway. You can. You choose. Yeah, I so always love hearing you play. Good music. Let's see if I got anything. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, I know what I want to play. 
Oh, here it says, play along with Johnny Hat. Okay, this is from Gospel Bob. Oh, no, this is from Boogie Woogie Santa Claus. Since it's Christmas. Right. This is my Let's base. Boogie Woogie Santa Claus. Boogie Woogie Santa Claus, right in there. Uh, one, two, three, four. says bridge turn are you still with me yes. here's a big out horse I just remember that I forgot uh, asking you about how was it playing with Dolly Parton? Oh man, she was a, a gas. She's such a lovely, ebullient, uh, just happy all the time. Yeah, she was great. Was we, it a tour? Uh, we did uh, t something like two months in Vegas, and then we had a few one nighters here and there, and that was it. It was just a one summer. And uh, it was me and the uh, piano player. We were the only two guys from from the West Coast. All the other guys were good old boys. But I did get out and play my fiddle on that show. We had dueling fiddles. Oh. She did a concert or uh, a costume change. That's cool. Oh. Have you played upright or, or electric on that one? Played bass guitar, yeah. Oh, okay. And how, they were how would you play with Little Richard? Little Richard, we didn't play with him we just were uh, in, we did sideline in a movie with him uh that that king ralph movie oh. was behind a scrim but we were sidelined but we did get to hung out with the guy he's funny i bet that was a that was a guess and um i also read in your bio that you played with bob dylan yeah we did this it was a weird show it's called the habad telethon and uh it was mainly a fundraiser show for, uh, I don't know, some kind of Jewish organization. So Dylan's Jewish, of course. Uh, John Davidson was on the show. All these people go, oh, you know, 
major players, but, but Jewish religion. And they had a cast of really hot L.A. session players in the band. Uh, Rick Baptiste, who is now vice president of the union, uh, was on trumpet. He, he, those guys were all, uh, he, was, he was just one of the legendary session trumpet players in L.A. So it was all good people. The Hodads were the rhythm section. Oh, that's that's how that gig came from. Uh, all right, my final question is like, how, uh, uh, where do you get the inspiration to still do what you've been doing for a long time? And then, how do you, why do you still do what you're doing? <laughs> well, you know, it's money, it's a living, and some gigs you go to and you hate them. But you, you you plow through it, and then and then there's some gigs that you can't wait to get there and play. Like with when I was playing with Bernie's big band, you know, the once you set up, which is a drag, loading in and out. That's the part I hate. Lucky for Bernie, he's got a roadie. Uh, you know, guys, the number one called drummer in town, so he's got cartage. I could I could believe it with him because it'd take him two hours to set his stuff up. I think. But uh, once you get past the load in and load out, the rest is a lot of fun. Usually I never have a bad time on gigs unless there's some, somebody, somebody really awful. But I usually say something to them. <laughs> that part about shut up, that's where I lose it. <laughs> you know, I'll yell at drummers a lot. I'll yell at them like I said, play with me and follow me, follow my beat. That's what you did. Bass players, we're here to keep the drummers in line. <laughs> and then, uh, well, you just put up with yeah, advice. And just be um, thankful that people are calling you, you know, for, for whatever. They could call the other guy next door. Uh, hey, thanks, Georgie. Good show you got. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being a part of the Slap Stream live from Slapsville. And I wish you all the best, and I definitely wish to to see you slap in that base somewhere in town or do, man. anywhere. Anywhere, yeah. Right now, if anybody yeah. needs any help with home renovation, tiling, uh, carpentry, roofing, that's what I've been doing. All right. That's why I got to have three clients well, this summer and uh, got one waiting as soon as I finish. We're just – we're right ready to grout the tile that we laid. Then we're cool. done. good luck with that. But I hope you're going to be focused back on bass and music. Oh, yeah. yeah, the home renovation doesn't pay as well as playing the bass for, on an hourly basis. Let's put it's not even it's not even close how cool that is. You know, with bass, <laughs> you're the coolest guy in town. I don't think so. Well, I'm one of them. All right. Thanks a lot. And um, can't wait to see you again. And good luck with everything. Thanks, Georgie. You have a great day. You bye, too. Bye. Thank you. bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. All right, everyone. All right. So this is the end of the 28th episode of the Slap Stream uh, with Georgie live from Slapsville. We had John Spaz Hatton. Uh, bass player for Brian Setzer Orchestra, and I'm not sure when you joined, but if you missed, you know, he also played with Elvis Presley and Dolly Parton, Bob Dylan, all kinds of cool people. Um, I would like to wish all of you um, Merry Christmas, you know, it's just in a few days, and I would like to thank to all of you for being uh, with me for you know 28 episodes so far and I know they're long you know but I you know I really like you know doing this show it's it makes me uh, it brings some sense in my life and uh, we have like a few more comments thank you Betty great show thank you Paul thank you Redback Lounge uh, Merry Christmas to you as well Cloudberry and Carolyn um, 
Johnny, thanks to all of you. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please hit that subscribe button and make sure to um, click on all notifications. That means that you should ring that bell under the video. If you'd like to support the channel, please check out the Venmo and PayPal links below. And if you'd really like to support the channel, which you know makes the most sense like on the long run is uh, to check out the Patreon, which is under the video. And um, Patreon is really helping me out like to do the to, to keep doing these shows every every Saturday. And I offer a bunch of perks like on Patreon. So I already have lots of people on there and thank you for that. Um, shout out for all these cats. It's under the video. All their names are there. And um, for the very end, I'm gonna play uh, one song for you, which is appropriate which is a song that I recorded, I think last year, and I recorded it for Christmas, and um, I hope that you're gonna enjoy it. I'll see you next Saturday. If you're not on our email list, also send an email at contact at artofslabbase.com, um, which is the website, my website dedicated to the Art of Slab Base. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook, all the links are below. Uh, please do that as soon as possible. And thank you, Fernando. And thank you, all of you. And you guys are really all over the place. Really happy to have this cool community around us uh, during these th crazy times. So please stay all the way to the end. And don't forget, never fret. Slide it in smooth and keep it in the groove. Uh, this is Georgia, and I'll see you in Slapsville uh, next Saturday. All right, it's taking me a bit. I wanted to play Jingle Bells for you, and now I have a, I prepared it, but I was not that well prepared, I guess. Let's see where we're at. All right, I think we're here. Slide it in smooth and keep it in the groove. This is Georgia. See you next Sunday.